It's just labeled as follistatin, and that is not going to do anything for you. It needs the virus to get into your DNA for it to, to work. Damn. So, so these people that are claim, like anecdotes from these are top bodybuilders <laughs> claiming that they're getting like a significant enhancement out of. All right, so we are here with Brian Mosco, aka the Gorilla Chemist, who is an organic and biochemist, has a master's degree from the Georgia, Georgia Institute of Technology and Chemistry, and also has a dietary supplement company called Chemix Lifestyle, if I'm not mistaken. And a lot of uh, novel introductions to the industry, I think, are um, a result of your like unique insight, research, and um, findings overall like i think i think you're probably the first one to come out with like even a gda if i'm not mistaken um like one that was like really popular like i when i went to blackstone that was one of the first things i wanted to do there was a gda by prime nutrition at the time it was very okay. like, small dosed and i was like we can do so much better and i did a huge dive into all the natural compounds and how they work and by lowering blood sugar or uh, increasing the way carbs can go through your body and the whole insulin pathway. And that's when I did glycolog and that it, it worked really well. Like, I, think, mm -hmm. I think I told you, you could you take carbs with it before you work out and then you have to actually feel the glycogen in your muscle. It's pretty crazy. Like the pump you get, knowing those carbs that you, like simple carbs you took, it's actually like uptaking them into your muscles. Yeah, I think, either knowingly or unknowingly, a lot of people have used a lot of products that have been either formulated specifically by you or inspired by formulations and things you brought to the forefront in the industry. So I just want to like put that out there as like a preface to this podcast this is probably like one of the first like really heavy chem pharmacology and supplementation podcasts we've done in a while. So um, I fertility. That. Yeah, <laughs> fertility, dude, we got to talk about that before we get to the supplementation stuff, because you've had, uh, you went through the ringer on restoring yeah. your fertility after being on, I don't know, like, what, I guess, could you do like an overarching summary of where you got how you got to where you're at, like your history with anabolic steroids, how, if you were totally infertile as a result of it, just any kind of like context to where you got that, uh, you know, where you had to then like really push the vector of some of the uh, like fertility aids and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so when I was 22, 23, I was uh, got into working out bodybuilding wise, like trying to get big and I first started using gear. And then I competed in bodybuilding at 25 through 27. So I've done like cycles in there. And then when I turned 32 i went on trt just permanently and then um when my wife and i talked about having a baby i was like okay um let's come off everything and let me see where we are and everything was in the gutter <laughs> like uh sperm was zero lh was zero fsh was nothing so initially um i got hcg and clomid at a low dose like a thousand fifteen hundred every couple days i mean not low but lower than it came out to be at the end. And then um, 50 megs of clomid every night. And then after three months, everything was still in the shitter and no sperm. So the doctor recommended FSH, which is a follicle stimulating hormone, which if you get the product HMG has both LH and FSH where HCG is just LH luteinizing hormone. And that, that was like the real game changer was taking the gonal, the FSH, because that is what really boosted my levels. So my test levels, when I came off everything, were like 30 something, 37 or something. And then Jeez. I got them up to like 210. And then they dropped down to like 180. And then once I got on the gonal, I got them back up to 510, 520. And they're kind of around there right now. But the biggest thing was my sperm count jumped from zero to like, 14 million which like 15 million is kind of like the cutoff so it's right there and my doctors like said you know keep doing what you're doing uh so i'm still taking hmg i'm still taking clomid i'm just not taking like the huge dose that i was and we're trying to have a baby so hopefully it works out 
So on your, what, before you got to this point where you were starting to try and have a kid and realized you were, had a sperm count of zero, how intense were your cycles and did you blast and cruise for the majority of it or was it totally cycling off and doing a PCT before you got on TRT at 30, 32 or whatever you said it was? And because I've always, it's something you always hear in the community is steroids won't make you infertile. Like it's a, it's a myth. Like everyone's able to have a kid after you come off and like you obviously learned the hard way that maybe it's not as easy as people make it out to be. And some people I feel like even stay fertile when they're using like crazy shit, like progestogenic people, drugs and whatnot. Yeah. Like all those deca babies out there. <laughs> yeah. But some people not, not as fortunate and have to go through the ringer for restoration of that. And I don't know if it's as widespread where everyone's going to be fine if they were fine at baseline. Like what has, what was your experience with that? And then also like the intensity of your use for blasting, cruising, TRT, all the way up to the infertility part. Okay, so cycle wise, that was yeah. a long, that's a lot of stuff. I'll yeah, just start, apologies we'll start the first for the thing. all over the place question. <laughs> um, cycle wise, I, I, uh, I learned like later on that for me, and I think from like a chemistry standpoint, using low daily doses is a much better effect and safer overall than taking some random 500 milligrams of this and 700 milligrams of that. Because if you think about how half lives work, the one it has like a 10 or 12 day and one has like a two day. So like, you're not getting a whole lot of overlap, but if you're doing daily stuff, you start to slowly build up every single day, your androgen levels. And I think that is where most of your muscle comes in. So my cycles were on paper, it looks like a lot, but it's really not. It was like one bottle of this, one bottle of this and one bottle of this for like seven to eight weeks, but you would do a little dose every day. Okay. Uh, and then I would come off when I was doing bodybuilding and um, when I was younger. And then when I went on TRT, obviously I didn't come off. And there's, there was a huge debate then about does HCG keep you fertile when you're on TRT? And I think my answer is yes, it does. And then I posted a study that about that. And, it, and I, I didn't know at the time because my doctor who gave me the testosterone. I was like, will I be able to have a baby later? He's like, yeah, we'll just give you fertility meds when you come off. And this was you know, years and years ago. So yeah, I did learn the hard way that these drugs, like if you take them long enough, they do suppress you where you can become uh, infertile or sterile, which, you know, I don't know, some people that's, they use it as a birth control. Some people don't, I don't know what your, everyone's aim is if you don't want to have kids, but if you play on having kids someday, the proper thing to do is to come off and give your body like a good rest. But you know how bodybuilding is and like, everyone wants something like now, now, now. So, okay. That was, that was one part of your question, right? Did like I, when I you were out? before, when you were doing the cycling and you say you came off entirely, was mm -hmm. that like literally clearance of all exogenous hormones? And do you, did you do a PCT with PCT drugs or would you just like clear hormones and restore natural AP, HPTA function? And you would, that would be your coming off. Cause a lot of people say, come off. And they actually mean like, I went to TR, I went to ACG no. <laughs> or I went to this. Well, yeah, I, when I, uh, I always recommend people doing a proper PCT and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, HCG and Clomid are pretty readily available. If you could get gear, you can get that. So I think that I've always pushed, you know, people need to come off in this proper way. So yeah, that's what I mean by coming off. When I like later on, when, like after I hit 30 and then when I hit 32, I finally stayed on testosterone. But uh, I think after like seeing how low my test got when I was around that age, I just like, I made the decision that my quality of life would be better if I just was on HRT, just because fluctuations, you know, hormones, like ups and downs, they are not good for you, for your body. You're trying to be in homeostasis and everything want, needs an equilibrium. And if you're, your hormones are out of whack, like everything is messed up, including mental state, everything. Mm -hmm. By the way, remember last time we talked, my audio was like really bad. Does it, yeah. sa does it sound good right now? Yeah, you sound fine. Like it's it's different than the last time? I'm just double checking. I, th I think so. With the headphones on, I, I think it is. is okay. It, is I just wanted to make sure it's, I have a, a Yeti mic right here, which is like a high quality mic. And last time I forgot to connect it. So I was talking to my like internal MacBook mic and yeah. it sounded horrendous. So I just wanted to double check that that is indeed 
it looks like it is correct. Okay, just wanted to double check. So before we get into um, coming off TRT to restore fertility, a very debatable and controversial topic, but do you wish in hindsight, whilst you were doing those blasts or your cycles, even if you came off, as well as when you were on TRT, that you use something to maintain intratesticular volume the entire time. So whether that be an HCG or an HMG or recombinant LH plus recombinant FSH, like whatever the, what combo, if any, would you have used in hindsight? I think I definitely would have done low dose HCG on everything, like no matter what my cycle was uh, to keep some type of production. Now, like knowing now, what happened versus you know 10 years ago um yeah i would definitely use hcg throughout my cycles and even like i said even on trt i think it's a safe move uh to do it I don't, there's no harm in it i don't see that like i used to think okay so this drug is sending a signal to your brain not to produce any testosterone where we have plenty and then HCG comes along and it's sending the opposite signal saying we, we don't have any testosterone produce more. I always thought that androgens would outweigh that. Um, but it turns out if you use a, just even just a small amount of HCG, like 200 micro or 200, I used every other day or something like that. It's better than nothing, like substantially better than nothing. Yeah. Like I was always, as I came up and like learned what I learned through the forums and, you know, all the random like bros who gave me information, et cetera, et cetera. I was always told I had heard HCG on cycle would make your PCT smoother, but it wasn't a necessity if you were going to be staying on. That was like the overall consensus I got. And in hindsight now, I think that a lot of people, especially as if fertility down the line is something that you would be, you are mindful of in any capacity, maintaining intratesticular volume whilst exposing yourself to exogenous anabolics to keep your HPTA shut down would be warranted to make that transition to trying to have a kid or maintain the fertility to even have that kid far that like easier to a point it, where, yes, like even the production of high quality sperm and getting your count up and the mor the motility and the morphology getting everything mm -hmm. on point. That's like, it's not like a quick thing. Like even for you, you saw how many, like some guys, it takes like a year to get to where they need to be. Like it after took me like 11 months after coming off everything. Yeah. So yeah. And especially was, if you're on like progestogenic drugs that have like residual negative feedback through progestogenic activity for like fucking like several months above and beyond their half-life clearance times. You end like up trust, in a trust alone is one big one. Yeah. Like I, I found that compound like a few, maybe 2000, I don't know, 17 or something or 18. Mm -hmm. and that, that shit's super strong. And, but it's also very, very suppressive. Like it, it I, I posted about the birth control study they should, they used it for. Yeah. And it, it like really shuts you down, but it, it turned, it's super anabolic. And yeah. uh, surprisingly for like a 19 nor compound, your androgen side was very strong. Like I felt that there was some conversion to maybe like uh, 19 or THT, something that was hitting your androgens up to keep up like sex drive because that was really high like during those cycles versus mm -hmm. um, I versus like someone who takes just nandrolone an or, or another nandrolone an derivative. I thought trestolone was very strong, but yes, that's something that suppresses you to like to the max where if you don't want to have a kid that's what you think yeah like i did i read a study recently i was doing a video on with this whole like roe versus wade you know uh abortion stuff i did uh i was reacting to a video on birth control modalities for men and it was like a guy who made a video called why don't men have birth control yet and apparently 80 percent of his audience was willing to take a hormonal birth control if it existed as a male and i was digging into some of the literature and they did one study on TRT and how many men could achieve achieve azoospermia and be like totally infertile with just testosterone and nothing else and on right. 100, 100 milligrams a week of test which is like an yeah. actual therapeutic replacement amount for a lot of men I'm not saying for everyone but for a lot of guys mm -hmm. they only had like 50 percent could achieve total infertility after multiple months to actually get that number to where 
it was even a potentially viable treatment option, they had to add in levonorgestrel on top at a high oh, yeah, dose, yeah. like almost, almost like half of like a plan B pill a day, pretty much to, to achieve that level of like azuspermia where you're like, okay, this might be viable. And even then it wasn't like a hundred percent certain. So you had like, a lot of people don't even realize level norgestrel is a 19 nor testosterone derivative mm -hmm. too. So yeah, you're taking yeah. like oral nandrolone with your test. And even still at that point, like that, that's what takes you from like, not flip a coin if you're fertile or not to <laughs> very, very infertile in the majority of cases. So like mm -hmm. 19 nors are like very, very suppressive like yep. above and beyond just standard like test derivatives from what i've seen anyways mm -hmm. hey, I, it's it's something with the like the mechanism of action that i don't I, it does just suppresses you so much more than anything else but before i forget did you see the the post that i've made there is a male birth control in the works that's from a, a vitamin a derivative yeah the retinoic acid mm -hmm. receptor alpha antagonist or agonist i don't remember but yeah i think it's antagonist yeah uh, I, but i thought that was cool and it's non it's not a testosterone yeah based so it, i think it's promising it's the only thing that i'm aware of that doesn't like totally doesn't require you to become a like feminized like infertile non-functional male because the options available it's like what would you do otherwise if you were if you were to actually deploy something like a level nergestrel? Like you're basically turning yourself into like a female. It, actually, worse than that because you're shutting down your entire HPTA to a point of just having like adrenal steroid production to achieve yeah. infertility. And then once you're there, you have to use TRT to maintain function as well. Otherwise, yeah. you're gonna feel like dog shit. You're not even gonna want to have sex. So what's the point of birth control at that point? You know, so. Yeah, it looks promising. Like it's 99% effective in rodents. I don't know how that's mm -hmm. going to translate into humans, but um, something that's not working through like chopping off signaling to your testes or something to actually produce testosterone, I feel like it's way more promising than everything else that's been looked at. Yeah, for sure. Hey, uh, I got to turn the light on. Can we pause this real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm going to go to the washroom right. while I do that. I'll pause it. All right. That. Okay, so we're back and we were just talking about uh, male birth control modalities and whatnot and kind of like novel drug candidates and stuff. And you meant we were both on the same page about if we could go back in time, probably would have used like an HCG to maintain intratesticular volume to make it a more seamless process into if you want to maintain fertility, you will be able to actually transition right into having a kid as opposed to going through like a long road back. But that long road back debatable as to if you should actually come off so for you obviously if you can maintain intratesticular volume and yeah with the hcg while you're on cycle what was your justification for actually coming off and like experiencing that nightmarish recovery phase where you're like low drive motivation sucks stress resilience <laughs> crashed like how come you came off um like so the hcg wasn't cutting it and um my doctor said that he needs if if I really want to get a good chance of boosting like sperm count, I would have to stop all exogenous testosterone. And like I even asked him, can I get the gel or anything? And said no. Like if you really want, you're at that point where you really can't risk taking anything because your margin of error is so small where we finally got you back to where you're fertile and it's still probably going to be hard. But it, it's, I asked him recently if I can get back on any type of hormone. And he said, I wouldn't eat just yet. But we froze like my sperm. So if something were to happen and I had to go back on, I could. And, you know, we could figure it out. But it was, God, it was like the worst 10, 11 months of my life. But during those 10, 11 months, like circling back to like when you first decided, okay, I want to have a kid, but my sperm count is zero you weren't on any HCG or anything with your TRT at the time, correct? No. So at that point when you're like, okay, I want to restore fertility, there was no attempt to just layer the HCG on top of the TRT first? Or what uh -huh. was the thought process behind that? Because like hypothetically, you can just manually hammer the lytic cells and Sertoli cells with, with either literal like HCG for an LH mimic, but then above and right. beyond that, if you wanted to put in the gonal 
like what it's not like the testosterone feedback to your HPTA is stopping you from stimulating it manually. So like, what was the justification for not keeping the TRT in there? Because the, from when, what I've read and, and what the research or what my doctor was saying is it's harder to reproduce or sorry, to get your sperm back up when you're on an exogenous. So like, even though you can have function, Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're making sperm and enough sperm. And I had, like I said, I had been on TRT straight for almost nine years. So I was very much, you know, shut down. And for me, it was more of a decision. Like, is it, you know, what's the best route for my family? You know, is that is testosterone going to inhibit this process, you know, even longer? Cause I'm old and, you know, we're trying to have a baby at my age is already hard. So I didn't want to do anything else that would make it even harder. Mm -hmm. So that that's, it was kind of like a personal choice based on, you know, what I've read and what I've experienced and what the doctor was telling me. See, the thing that I question about that whole process and makes me really question if doctors are fully <laughs> in the know when they make these suggestions is if you go back and like peel back the layers of the onion, we have your testosterone shutting down your HPTA. So at a high level, the only reason you have no sperm is because you don't have LH and FSH going from the pituitary to your gonads. So right. if we're able to manually replace that signal with an LH mimic like an HCG, you can manually manipulate that strength of signal to whatever degree you want. So it's not like your LH of like five or six or whatever you can get it up to is somehow vastly superior to this HCG you're introducing into the equation from a lighting cell stimulation aspect. So like, even if I have testosterone shutting down my entire HPTA, why can't I hammer the lighting cells with a either recombinant LH or HCG to whatever extent I want and get that intratesticular testosterone production still. And then from the Sertoli cell aspect, the exact same thing with recombinant FSH or HMG, whatever it is that you choose to do it. So sometimes I question this logic because it's like, they're saying that testosterone is going to make it harder, but it's like, we're, we're achieving the same stimulation of the same cells just by a different modality than endogenous LH and FSH. So like in that, I, is it unnecessarily putting yourself in a situation where your quality of life gets thrashed for like a year just to get what you could have otherwise got with the exact same recombinant version of the hormone manually administered that's what i would question that's a, i don't know if that would really be the case i think it like you talked about it's a degrees thing right so which is which hormone is overpowering which is the signal that you're getting from testosterone suppressing the uh, signal for lh and fsh more than taking the signal from hmg to raise to, to raise it you know what i mean i think it's just a intensity thing so and the fact coupled with the fact that i had been on for so long mm -hmm. without without um like just on straight trt yeah. i think that i don't i personally don't think that even doing the doses because i think i told you i was doing ten thousand i use of hcg a week which is mm -hmm. a shit ton so that's a bottle a week they had me doing and um so i don't think i could have achieved the same thing with that and gone while taking, I mean, maybe taking like a super low dose, but not taking like 200 or 150 or something like that. I, I think personally that it's, like you said, it's an, an intensity thing. So it, which signal is stronger? But the thing that I also question too about that logic is if I'm using HC, let's just say I'm on TRT, I, I come off because the whole premise is we don't want to have competing. We don't want to have your HBTA shut down while we're trying to use the HCG. So we come off of all hormones. So now we have the ability to restore LH and FSH once testosterone is cleared naturally. But once I introduce that HCG as a lighting cell uh, stimulator, an LH right. mimic, I still have negative feedback to my HPTA. So I have zero endogenous LH and FSH while I'm on HCG and gonal. So like that justification to pull out the test that reason is eliminated anyways when you're off the test too because you still have no endogenous lh and fsh so like yeah i, I know with like you're the feedback loop i mean i am like if you're on hcg you're shut down like right well kind of i mean you're you you could at take, the testicular level at that part of the axis you're not shut down but the hp 
yeah. is, is wiped. So like you coming off the TRT to try and get your LH and FSH back up, you are essentially my, my understanding, by the way, I'm not saying you did it wrong or anything. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying like for people, if I could save somebody the thrashing of their life for like a year by at least considering this alternative outcome, I'm not saying either is correct. I'm just saying my thought process around it. If I'm on right. TRT, I come off because my doctor says, okay, we want your LH and FSH to come back naturally. Okay, I get it. But once that starts to happen, if I introduce HCG now, what was the difference between me keeping the TRT in there plus HCG versus no TRT and HCG? None from a pituitary aspect. My LH and FSH are still like crashed, I would think, given the negative feedback from the HCG and FSH if I'm using it too. So like, that's just where I question, like, was there actual utility to pulling out the test when I'm otherwise shutting down the HP part of the axis anyways right. by stimulating the T, the testicular part? When I, when I tested my FSH levels while on Gonal, like my LH was, was trashed, even on HCG, it was still like less than 0.5, but my FSH got up to like 2.3 five or something like that i think is that so, cross detecting the recombinant fsh because it's actual fsh though i that's that's like a huge thing that i always question about you know how can you tell how can your body tell the difference between the exogenous or the the, the signal if, if if um lh was sending the signal and your your lh levels are super low because you're introducing that through um hcg my fsh though theoretically should have been low if I was using exogenous, but it was high. And they said that that's the way they kind of can see that you have restored some of the function. Cause you're correct. If you take like HCG, it, it shouldn't pop up. It'll pop up low on your levels. But if you have like low HCG and then high testosterone, that means it's working. But my FSH was like super low and then got up to like normal range while I was taking uh, gonal. So I think that if the logic was taking Gano would shut down the signal for FSH, then that would have been lower, but it was higher. And I don't think that it's detecting the exogenous, but I don't know for sure. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because when you read about it, it's like Gano helps treat male infertility by increasing the FSH levels in the body. But it's like, is that because it is literally recombinant fsh or because it's actually increasing your fsh production and then is that cross detecting in serum where you otherwise think it's natural but it's just the shit you're injecting hmm. i know well i think i think that it just from like a personal use because this is my first experience with Gonal or, or hng i think that there's a difference to, especially with the the sperm count so like hcg the feedback loop that you get from it, i understand your logic what you're saying I just think that the FSH, I, I, I think it just works differently as far as keep, it's not so much as testosterone production as it is like sperm. Uh, yeah, it's all Sertoli cell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think I think that's the, I don't know, I, in, in my opinion, I don't think it's always great to have telling your body have two different signals, like to do something else. But again, if you're already at, you know, zero, to, you know what is if, if you introduced testosterone and you're already at no testosterone will it affect it i don't know i just know that it took me a while to get my levels to like normal and i don't know if it would would be the same outcome i would love for somebody to to track the results like i did yeah and what, see what was your dose of gonal again that you used uh 75 iu uh, three times a week which is uh, I believe HMG has 75 IU of that and 75 IU of LH. Yeah. So so uh, HMG, I think is the better option if you can get it. But there at the time, my doctor was I was already taking prescribed HCG and then he gave me the prescribed Gonal, which dude that stuff's like eight hundred dollars a month for like twelve uh yeah twelve injections. It was retarded. Yeah. So definitely something to be mindful of for guys who are blasting for years and want to achieve fertility one day too, is the, not just the process of getting back fertility, but the potential consequences on a quality of life aspect, a money aspect too. Yeah. access, like as these things get classified as biologics, like who knows what access is going to be like in the future. Like, yeah. Everyone's so. telling me it was really hard to get HCG. My, I didn't have a problem like getting it, but 
uh, a lot of people that were hitting me up just asking me where are you getting it it's like, i don't know my pharmacy gets it for me but like these the trt clinics i think they're trying to like ban hcg from a compounding standpoint is that correct yeah yeah they're uh they've been class reclassified to and they're far more cost prohibitive and harder to get access to than they used to be i know i remember they used to be eat super easy to get when uh when i should have been taking them and then it, i had to get a doctor with a script to, to actually get legit stuff no the wild thing is, is if you are in like certain european countries where you can just like walk into a pharmacy and buy whatever you want you can get pregnal for like six bucks or something just like yeah. A, yeah and then here it'll be like half a, like 500 bucks or something it's insane i was with it, my insurance didn't cover any of it and i think each bottle of pregnal for ten thousand i used was uh hundred and twenty dollars a week uh, and then yeah exactly and then there the other drug that they have which is like overreal or something like that mm -hmm. is uh is synthetic lh because hcg or pregnant is extracted the synthetic one was even more for like a small for 250 micrograms it was something it was probably the same price like 200 bucks a shot or something it's hard jesus <laughs> christ yeah it's like, it's like above and beyond like pharma gh pricing almost it, it is and <laughs> don't let's not get started on big pharma in my opinion on that <laughs> okay <laughs> no worries what, by the way what do you think about bodybuilders having female children do you think the likelihood is higher like anecdotally obviously <laughs> there is there's differing opinions and obviously there's examples on both sides of the spectrum where you can have um like you'll you'll easily be able to pick out bodybuilders who have uh you know, males, even predominantly of like, you know, their entire family. But do you think that or there is a higher likelihood of certain gender as a result of anabolic exposure? I, I don't think so. Personally, I think that I don't I don't see how the androgens like long term, especially if you come off of them, increase the the increase the the way you would get, you know, an X or Y, or not you, but like give the X or the Y to the to make the baby. Mm -hmm. I just I can't see that. It's, I mean, it's not it's not affecting your DNA like that, where it would just, you know, your entire sperm is now only producing one chromosome to give. You know what I mean? I don't I don't see it that way. But and then you do. I don't think you could control the sex of it, and I don't think that steroids have an influence on it i think you can influence it more with like in other ways like crispr for sure you can do mm -hmm. it but i don't i don't think that you know well, have it. why do you, do you have an opinion on that <laughs> well it's not based on like real science so i could not give like a logical explanation why it doesn't yeah it didn't make sense yeah like i just anecdotally even though i wouldn't be able to assert for that it is a genuine thing Personally, if I was having a kid, I would be mindful of it and thinking that, I don't know, it just feels like based on anecdotes that it is more likely to happen that you have a female, but there's no way to assert why, and it doesn't even really make sense. Like if you're, if you're super androgenic on test and using a shit ton of androgens, like it would seem paradoxical that you end up with a female than the other way around. Right. And a lot of people I know that got pregnant on gear. I mean, this is just the, my circle have mm -hmm. male babies. So like, I, I don't know, you look at bodybuilders who have kids and like flex had a girl and then had a boy and you know, it's, I, I really don't think that that's influencing it at that point. Okay. Well, hopefully that is the case. Cause a lot of people are probably, uh, watching probably <laughs> don't want it to be true. As either. So as far as circling back to your cycles you did and you kind of mentioned the approach you took that you felt was the best for getting the most out of the least and stuff like that or mm. the micro dosing kind of way you would go about it for the half lives and whatnot is there anything if you could go back in time to like day one of anabolic exposure that you would have done differently like stand out things that you really think you fucked up that if you could go back and you wish you wish this education was available when you were coming up sort of thing yeah uh for one like arimidex had like just come out or like mm -hmm. a couple years beforehand and it was super expensive and not readily available and i 
didn't have access to get something like that. So you get something like Novodex, which is works okay, but that's a whole another level, a whole different level of, you know, blocking the enzyme. So I wish that that would have been around more. And I, didn't, I mean, at that time, it was a newer drug. So most people didn't even know that what that class of drugs were. So that's one thing. Um, listening to, I don't know, when you, everyone gets a coach and the coach, everyone always wants to listen to their coach and then always like questions what their coach says. So like, why you hire a coach? Cause they give you like, they're like, I don't even know where they come up with the cycles. They're like, take this amount of this and this amount of that. And so what I, at one point I was taking like three different things at, you know, a dose of like 300 of this and 500. And I was just thinking about why am I doing this? Like, what is the ratio? This is before I went to school. Mm -hmm. Cause I went back to school for chemistry after I'd been finished competing. And that's when I kind of learned how things are actually working. But yeah, I would definitely do more research on like half-lives and how to get the most out of a low dose. Cause a lot of people, I think they kind of just throw numbers out there and that don't have any logic behind it. They're just like, okay, well, if 200 works this well and 500 will work this well and a thousand will work this well, it's just, I just don't think that's how you should do it. Like you could fuck yourself up by if you don't start low, like some people reach out to me and they say, this is my first cycle. I'm taking 500 of tests and like 400 of the deck. I'm like, why, why are you doing this? Like that's so much when you can grow on half that. And yeah. you can probably grow on just half of that testosterone and not even need the nandrolone. It's just, everyone thinks your first cycle is like the best gains ever. And I don't think that's true. No. Yeah. Like, I don't think you're like wasting potential if you don't like crank hard on your first cycle like if anything you're dragging out your potential and being more mindful of side effect profile and trying to get the most out of the least and then yeah when you actually need to break a plateau and you've already maximized food rest recovery like all that stuff training volume you can no longer adapt to maybe like the last thing is like okay now the dose goes up as opposed to like start at a dose you don't even need yet right and then like everything else is lagging behind sort of thing at least that was, that's the thing. One of the main things I've come to learn over the years that I wish in hindsight, I knew, cause I was one of the, <laughs> you know, read the forums first yeah. cycle, 500 tests plus an AI 12 weeks on take two weeks off after you stop injecting it, <laughs> start a PCT, even though the drug hasn't even cleared out of your system yet. And yeah. then four weeks of that, and then you're good. And that, that was, was always like, the, that was the bro thing two weeks after your last shot. Yeah. Right? Like that was always no matter the said. compound. It's, yeah. it's a long like, ester, like two weeks. Yeah. And you're good. S sustanon two weeks later, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> what's funny is like, if you take sustanon, I think every other day and you do it for like six weeks, it's still active for another like eight weeks in your body mm -hmm. due to like the half-life of the undeck. Unde still, yeah. still going. So like you could, theoretically be off for almost eight weeks but you're still on because of the how long the ester is and the clearing of it stuff. no like so. when guys like use eq and they think that mm -hmm. bold and known is out of their system enough after two weeks to start a pct and then they're four weeks on nova and clomid has somehow restored fertility and they don't even realize they're still on bold and by the time they start their next cycle it's like yeah yeah the, well the forums are, are fun and, and I definitely learned a lot when I was younger from them, but you also learn what not to do from forums yeah. and you have to take it as a grain of salt. You know, no, nobody on there is, you know, that's a forum. They're just somebody who's probably used a lot of gear. Most of the people, not yeah. nobody, but most people on forums were just, you know, gearheads that like do this, do that. And then you as a 20 something year old kid doesn't know any better. Yeah. So yeah, in, in hindsight, I would have done more research. I wish I would have had, AI access and then um, proper, like real proper PCTs every single time. Like I think the long, I think long cycles, I was, you know, um, was it Dave Palumbo? It always wanted the long, like 16 week cycle thing. I never, now I would never ever do something that long. I think the longer you're on, just the more side effects you get and the residuals oh, really? versus like, if you do like this, the small daily dose, like I was saying, like, um, for six to eight weeks, it's almost like slipping under the radar where like your suppression hasn't fully hit yet. So you can still restore the signals to your LH and FSH and um, versus 16 weeks of something like test and DECA or something ridiculous. You know, I think, I just think that the shorter time you're on, you can maximize gains. Like I worked with a pro who I won't name, 
but experienced pro, been around for a long time, and was able to put muscle on him with a seven week cycle of what I do versus what he would normally do. And he's already a huge person. So I do think that there's legitimacy to using the small daily doses. Um, there's a couple of people have spoke out about it. Uh, Dusty Hanshaw does it daily. And a week I was on his podcast with Ron and uh, we talked about it and he, he, he divides his TRT dose into seven and just does that much each day. I just think that building your daily androgen levels is a much better, like from mitigating side effects and from getting actual your levels up like increased i think that's the better route to go than waiting for the slow one to peak you're kind of like pushing it up the stairs so obviously the counter argument to that would be the actual development of muscle is a long process and it's not something you can mm -hmm. like x like you see the scrutiny like tony huge gets for his like mass blasts <laughs> Yeah. Like for, for those kind of things, he does like, I don't know, like a month where he just hammers himself and then claims he gets out of four weeks what he could have otherwise got of like six months, six months. Of, a, of, a, <laughs> of a reasonably like more conservative approach. So in that mindset, like obviously you're not suggesting like that, obviously, but like if you were, <laughs> if you were doing an in-between where you're not going 16 weeks, but you're not condensing it into like four, are you just using short esters only? and micro dosing them every day. And then you're, you still think you can get the muscle growth response you want out of like a couple months of exposure or like, what's the kind of justification behind that? So, so twofold one, if you're using steroids to build muscle, you already have had to, you should have exhausted other options of building muscle. Right. So mm -hmm. you, you should do all changing and training and you should be experienced in that stuff. So that way, this is just like, icing on the top on the cake right so if you've already done that the my approach was that if you use if you start off with a, a longer ester say like um sip for sipionate for the first week or for the first day and you do that for say like 10 days right you do i don't know 100 mix a day or something like that while that's starting to peak at that 10th day you introduce something short acting you know, with like a pro ester or, or um, acetate or something like that. And that was like, while you're starting to slowly peak, then you have something that really peaks quickly. So like the, the area under the curve is just getting bigger and everything is kind of peaking at the same time. And then in the middle, you throw in like very low doses of an oral and that is even quicker. So like you're kind of pyramiding your levels up by having all the half-lifes come together at the same time, instead of one like long peak going like this and then one going like this so you're, you're never gaps it's always like a nice uh bell curve so is there like a duration of exposure that you feel is reasonable where it's like like presumably there's some number of weeks whereby you would think it's too short to actually mm -hmm. pack on any substantial muscle versus you're just getting the you know transient increase in like glycogen you know blood volume etc that you you a lot of people perceive as gains like guys who take the right. ball for three or four weeks <laughs> and they think they gain 20 pounds of muscle when in reality it's just you know shit like fluff but yeah. there's some level presumably where it's like a minimum amount of weeks you think to actually like pack on like new contractile tissue like yeah. what where is that do you think i think it's somewhere in the up to eight week mark where you, you're actually building tissue and it's not all glycogen or water. I, I don't, I know that it does take time to build muscle, but you have, but if you're increasing your androgen levels, you like how, how I'm talking about and you're eating and sleeping and doing everything properly. It's, I think it's a, it's a bigger shock to your body to signal all of the increasing protein synthesis and through the androgen pathway through like the mTOR path, like all of these things working together. So that way your, your body is actually in a very anabolic state versus um, taking something for so long for the, like, I think you'll get the same. I think four weeks is too short. And a lot of people that do those kinds of blasts, I think a lot of it isn't, it can't be muscle because it does take time to do muscle. It's like when people tell me they take growth and they've already put on like five pounds in a week or something yeah. like your body it doesn't work like that yeah, yeah, yeah but people are so fixated on like numbers and the scale where like i i, tr I truly believe you can build muscle within that 
seven, eight week range versus you don't need the full four months to pack on that size if you've already, you know, been trained how to pack on muscle. So after that point, even if it's been, let's just say I'm at eight weeks of exposure, you would want to see somebody still come off entirely and not just go down to a therapeutic replacement amount and like try and recover full HPTA function or like, what do you think? If, so it depends on like their goals and what their, their health is. If it were me personally, I would like that, that eight week mark is right. Kind of when your body is saying, okay, we've been suppressed for this long we're not going to produce anymore. So that's the other reason why I think the shorter cycles work better because you're not fully, I don't think the degree of shutdown is the same when you're on like six, eight weeks versus uh, 14 weeks. The, the logic is you're using some, some half-lives that are slightly longer and then some really short ones and then like kind of clearing them out of your system by the time you are trying to do like a PCT on there. That's, that's the idea behind it. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Like I know, you know, um, Arthur, Arthur L. Rhea, he, he wrote a big book on like building the perfect beast. He talks a lot about this stuff. It's a good reference. Okay. Huh. Yeah. I think I probably have that book saved. I just haven't actually read it, but I've heard of it many times. You and should definitely yeah. uh, look it up. It's a good read. Okay, cool. He was like way ahead of his time on lots of stuff. Now, if you were to circle back to, again, like stuff you would change if you could go back in time, is there a certain compounds that you would preferentially use that you think are better tolerated versus like hammer yourself with a shit ton of trend or this or that? <laughs> like, do you think there is kind of like, like presumably most people aren't getting it, that are using this shit aren't actually top competing bodybuilders. And despite what a lot of people say, and everyone wants to be noble about why they're using shit. A lot of them are doing it for vanity purposes and just want to get the most out of their body. And I don't think like whatever you want to do with your body is your own personal decision. If you were to take like the, the harm mitigation approach, trying to get the most out of the least and using the safest, safest, nothing safe right. and abusive territory, but there are some mm -hmm. compounds that are arguably much better than others. Like what would you focus on as like your safer drugs? Um, less aggressive. Uh, I think trend has this like mystic thing about it where everyone thinks it's amazing and nothing compares to it. And then people take so much of it. Like it, it is really strong, but you don't need that much of it to really notice a difference. Mm -hmm. People, and I definitely don't think you should take the, the long acting version at the enanthate. I think you should, anytime you take trend, it should be the acetate. I just don't like the, how long that lingers in your body. Mm -hmm. and the that just you know more side effects can come that way in my opinion so like knowing that i would have probably done the first time i ever tried trend it would have been a much lower dose than the the bro like 75 makes every other day or 100 people like 100 every day so that's a lot of fucking yeah trend. <laughs> yeah um so i would probably do that and then my preference i really liked um winstrol injectable I always like felt that it was really anabolic and I didn't get a lot of the side effects from it. I didn't like, lose hair or anything like that. I think that that was like, if you can get real um, wind straw that's in water, I think that that was, uh, that was, that was one of my favorites and test suspension. I love that. Um, I used to get that from a doctor actually in, um, when I lived in Florida. And the, I do think that that one, if you're talking about potency, that's the biggest one there is. It's test suspension. That's a tough cycle to do, dude. Injecting that shit on like a daily basis. Like, yes. I, I think the most prevalency of, of infections I've ever seen is from Winstrol yeah. injectable. It, it is because, well, because it's, if you're talking about like underground lab shit that people yeah, are making yeah. at home, they don't have the like sterility of like a clean room where it should be made. But like mine was a compounding pharmacy for the yeah. suspension and uh, so was the windshield. So like I trusted it and I knew that it was, uh, that the, there wasn't bacteria growing in there or, yeah. you know, someone wasn't stirring this in, in their kitchen and shit. So that's where the, I mean, you, you read about people getting infections all the time. And like back in the day, like all the Mexican gear and the test flu, yeah. the test flu wasn't from test. It was from like the bugs that were in the, in the mm. oils and all the gr uh, crap that was in there that your body didn't want. So of the, of the compounds you would like, presumably you're not going to rely on 
suspension and water-based no. withdrawal <laughs> for building your tissue though. So if you were to like do your, like, let's just like say you're starting. Yeah. Yeah. If you're trying to like okay. build your physique, like what are your main compounds that you think are the biggest ROI for the risk that you're imposing on yourself? Uh, NPP. I like a lot. The quick okay. acting, I think, because I think nandrolone is super anabolic, but I don't like the decanoate ester being so long. Yeah. Um, so I think the NPP is a good one. Uh, regular, any test sip is always like a good starting point. And um, I did like uh, Bolden on, uh, if you wanted to, like as a first cycle to be safer than almost all other things, I think that taking a low dose, like bold known can help out. You build muscles slowly, you know, you're not putting on a bunch of water, you're not stressing your body out. Um, you're not like with other things like anadrol or, you know, high levels of tests or anything like that. I think it's a safe, safer compound. Do you ever, um, than some of the androgens. did you ever have any experiences with like estrogen, low estrogen related side effects on EQ by chance? Cause it's like, no, something I know there's I've, a debate. Yeah. Like I've actually seen it play out. Like obviously it's not a clinical study, so it's not like I can assert for certain that it does this, but what I've seen from a lot of blood work at this point is, and this is again, depending, it gets to the sensitivity of testing too. Like if you test using LCMS <laughs> for estradiol sensitive assay versus using an ECLIA amino assay, you're going to get cross detection. And for EQ, it seems to compete very strongly for aromatase to a point where it prevents testosterone from aromatizing to estradiol. And you end up with almost like a, a similar effect to what you get out of like, like estro or something. Yeah. Like to, like some, a, to some extent, because I don't know if there's as much like estrogen induced RNA transcription inhibition as opposed to like a masteron or a DHT itself. Well, but, yeah, DHT, yeah. Yeah, but the actual like competing for aromatase and then maybe even producing like an, a synthetic estrogen metabolite, like similar to D-ball makes like methyl estradiol. Right. It, seem, it seems to spit something out that is synthetic, but is not very good at agonizing estrogen receptors to where it like lowers your estrogenic burden systemically overall when you use it. So it's like 500 tests plus no EQ is like more estrogenic than 500 tests plus 400 EQ, even though you're using more gear just because it's inhibiting tests from making the same amount of estradiol and whatever right. estrogen analog or synthetic estrogen the EQ makes is like not as potent as bioidentical estradiol. That right. is what I've seen anecdotally in your experience. Did you find like any need to change your AI or not use an AI or anything when you use EQ? I didn't. I actually did not use an AI at all when I was taking just EQ by itself. Okay. Um, I think that, that I, I don't know how much truth there is to it actually inhibiting the enzyme or the, like, like you were saying, but I do think that it, the metabolites from boldenone, like where the hydroxyl group is put on the molecule to make it an estrogen is different than um, just converting straight to estradiol. So the, like the metabolite of boldenone is not, like you said, it's not binding super hard to the E2 as say estradiol is or another metabolite. Yeah, like from what I've seen, it seems like testosterone derivatives are substrates for aromatase. It's just the degree to which they bind and then compete with test, whatever your test base is in addition to whatever synthetic estrogen it spits out. Because EQ is basically D-ball. Like obviously it's not, it's not actually, but like the, dif the difference is like a methyl group, right? Because the two double bonds are the same. It's yeah. just the methyl group versus non-methyl. Yeah, it's so funny. So for anybody to think that D ball definitively converts to methyl estradiol or whatever the synthetic estrogen is, which we know exists for sure and is quite problematic in some individuals, but then EQ doesn't convert to a synthetic estrogen and has no no affinity for aromatase, like that makes no sense to me at all. Well, so, okay, so for, I don't know, let me break this down to, for everybody to understand it. So diol means two hydroxyl groups, right? Two OHs. And you, the one that's on the 17th carbon is the one that is also methylated in D-ball. And that mm -hmm. prevents that hydroxyl group from getting oxidized into a ketone group, which then is inactive. So how DHEA has a hydroxyl group there, 
um, and on the on carbon three, and it gets oxidized into um, interesting dial or yeah, interesting dione, and then interesting dial. The same thing is happening with estrogen. So, like if you put a methyl group, it, it essentially it blocks certain metabolites from being made, and it's very hard in your body to remove a methyl group. That's why those are kind of harsh compounds on your body. So that methyl estradiol compound is a, is stronger. Like it's, your body's not going to break it down as easily as we break down estradiol, and yeah. that methyl group prevents that hydroxyl group on the 17th carbon to becoming inactive. So it keeps it active for longer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I forget what it was, but it was like hepatic resistance, like methyl estradiol. I forget the exact terminology of why, like what you just said, it obviously chemically explains it, but like when you break down the clearance capacity of your body, even though the methyl estradiol doesn't necessarily agonize the ER to the same potency as like a estradiol bioidentical, the clearance of it is like way That's, more problematic. So it, yeah. ling it lingers and it like can it, fuck you up more <laughs> and yeah, be harder and, to but, modulate. But that's exactly why. Cause yeah. you know, it's in, it's called a, like you have a tertiary alcohol instead of a secondary, which means like you can't convert it back to a ketone. It's really hard. Mm. It's like very stressful for your body to like demethylate uh, ah. that. And if you know, if you look at a lot of like pro drugs or um, a lot of compounds have, methyl groups on them uh on like a or a methoxy group so it's like a methylated hydroxyl group to that your body has to break down first and convert it into hydroxyl for it to work mm -hmm. so like a lot of drugs are patented that way on purpose so like they make the the methyl group there which makes it inactive and then your body has to transform it to the active group so it's it's really just like playing around with chemistry but it is hard for your body to like carbon carbon bonds are very hard to break they're not the easiest of the chemical bonds to break. They love, they kind of are very strong. So for your body, it does put a lot of stress on, on your liver and organs to break down that methyl, to remove that methyl group so your body can metabolize it as it normally would be, the bioidentical oh. version. No, that's interesting. That's like the first time I've heard somebody break down the chemistry of why <laughs> the D-ball specific estrogen is more problematic. Like I've read about it and understood it's harder to clear and actually metabolize, but like the chemical structure why that is was not like adequately elucidated from what i've seen so that's interesting to hear yeah that, that's i think that's the cool thing about chemistry is like you can change one thing and, and it blocks enzymes from happening or it blocks a like one functional group can either make something bind more strongly or not bind at all it's, it's yeah. really cool how it works i think so one thing that is often debated as well as pro bodybuilder doses. Now, I don't necessarily <laughs> think anyone should be using those if they're not trying to step on stage and like win a pro show or something. But like the debate, I think a lot of people think every pro is lying when <laughs> I think some definitely do want to underplay their use. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think they're all lying through their teeth when they talk about their stuff. Like in general, what have you seen to be commonplace in like an off season versus a contest prep, just as far as like a typical cycle for a pro, which should not be replicated by anybody watching, of course, but just for curiosity's sake. It, the funniest thing is it really depends on who their coach is. Cause mm. if you have somebody like, um, I don't know if I want to name names of coaches, but some are yeah. much more he heavier on the use than others. Yep. And so, like some actually focus way more on the, the diet and the sleep and all the other things that are really important. And some are just kind of drug pushers. So I've seen like low, low pro cycles that you would, that you would think this is somebody's beginner or like gym rat cycle where they're doing maybe their base is 500 mix of tests. And then they have maybe 50 mix of trend, depending on where they are, if it's off season, maybe like, 40, 50 mix of D ball every day, and then maybe 400, 600 mix of DECA a week or something along those lines. They usually have a few things compound wise, but their doses, like it really just depends on who they're listening to. Cause I've worked with people and they tell, they show me what they're taking and let's, let's cut that in half first. Let's, let's start there yeah. and see, see how you grow without all of this stuff. Cause you can always add in more, but you can't just take stuff out, you know? So I think that a lot of pros 
probably do lie to on social media and stuff like or in the public about what their true cycles are but i i don't think that everyone is on 2000 milligrams of test a week and uh, you know a thousand milligrams of trend a week and all these ridiculous numbers you hear from like rich piano I used to spit out huge numbers and i just while he's a knowledgeable guy and he built a physique i don't think that that's the right move because kids that are like 21 are going to try that and mm -hmm. it's just going to like totally wreck their system and wreck wreck like future gains because if you start off there you're, you can't go back you know mm -hmm. so i think um it's not as not everybody was is blasting as much as you think but some some of the coaches are like i've seen ridiculous cycles where i just question where those numbers came up from so an interesting paradigm is the total burden of drug in an off season versus a contest prep. So oftentimes you'll hear people say your food and training, mainly your food should be the thing that drives like your progress in the off season. The drugs mm -hmm. don't need to be as high because you are in a very, very conducive state to grow simply yeah. by your, like the actual presence of adequate nutrition versus in a contest prep, you're deprived, you're in a catabolic state. So you have to use more drugs, to retain what you have so then but al also there's the idea of showing up with a cosmetic look that you otherwise could not achieve <laughs> without like certain drugs being thrown into the equation that are like hardening agents and this and that right so like in general what do you see as like the not saying like this should be replicated or anything but there is a debate as to should dosages be higher in the off season when you're trying to actually grow new tissue because it's harder to grow than it is to retain what you have. Right. So should dosages be higher then versus in contest prep, you just need to retain what you have and show up shredded or vice versa. Should it be lower dosages in off season because you have a bunch of food and then you push the dosages in contest prep because you're catabolic and you need to throw in all these hardening and drying agents and shit. Like, what do you think about that kind of like, because there, you have to kind of pick and choose when you're going to expose your body to the most stress, and you and you only have so much exposure that your organs can sustain at the end of the day. So you have to be pretty <laughs> meticulous about choosing when to allocate that heightened level of stress. Like, what do you think is the reasonable approach for when it makes the most sense to push versus have like just what you need, sort of thing? So, old school bodybuilding is all about like the low stuff in the off season rely on food and training because you're not trying to maintain a certain look you know mm -hmm. versus versus uh, when you come in for a competition i think that the less stress you put on your body the better and competing on its own if you are natural puts so much stress on your body between yeah. like cardio all the time and taking pre-workouts and doing everything that you would do for like fat burners and all these things that are stressing the shit out of your adrenal glands um to add more gear on top of that i think is just throwing like gas on the fire i think that you should be focused on the i don't want to say like the important ones but the ones that have a good anabolic androgenic like balance because you do need some androgenicity to get super hard and mm -hmm. but i think i don't think that dieting is the time to push it because like you said you're not if you're using that amount of drugs, you might as well get the benefit of eating the food, right? And get and building the actual tissue. I don't think, uh, at least from my perspective, you should push your body that hard during prep because you're already stressing it so much. So when I do prep for people, I really it's really not a lot of gear comparative to like if someone asked me in the off season to build something. Okay, and that's so, that's so what I think. I would be... rather put it. Go ahead. Sorry. I would just rather, you know, you, it's to me, use the androgens when you're giving your body actually nutrients to grow mm -hmm. versus when you're really just trying to hold on to muscle. I don't think that, I think people think that the androgens are less anabolic than they really are. I think you don't need a whole lot to maintain muscle. Yeah. Cause like one thing I do definitely see commonplace is pre contest, especially is people panic about thinking that there's a, a, a compound produces a look that nothing else can produce. <laughs> and if you don't have this compound in, then you're doing yourself a disservice when you step on stage. So they end up on literally the kitchen sink where it's like, well, I can't not have my trend in there. 
but I need my master on for drawing out, but I need Halo to be hard, but I need this to be grainy, but I need this for to be fucking cement, like all of these <laughs> different things. And you end up on like every single drug essentially. And it's like, oh, and I need Anadrol to fill out and I need this and I need that. <laughs> and then they end up on like eight compounds and it's like, yeah. even though the dosage of each might look almost reasonable, they end up on like three to four grams of weekly shit just and they're not even building they're just retaining tissue exactly just to try and present a cosmetic look that maybe and probably could have otherwise been achieved with just like a couple of the like you know synthetic dhc derivatives or maybe a bit of trend or something too yeah i think i mean dorian yates was pretty open about what he used and i know people may or may not believe him but uh his pre-contest stuff was pretty simple and i think that I agree with you that there's that certain compounds have been associated with certain things. Halo gets you hard or Anovar gets you green or, or whatever the case is. And Anadrol fills you. That's so funny. <laughs> I know, I know people that take Anadrol like the last five, you yeah. know, the last couple of weeks did like, I got to fill out. And I'm like, oh, yeah. it's your body's not going to do that right away. So um, I did, I do think certain drugs got associated with certain things, but I don't think, that you need all that stuff. I think you need something, like I said, it has a good anabolic androgenic ratio. I think that if you're gonna choose to go higher on something, keep it with uh, something that is anabolic. You can always control the estrogen, which is what's the water retention is caused from. So I would rather err on that side than like need mixing multiple orals and then things like trend that stress your body and, and the doses that are super high and then you always have to have some tests and then adding like GH and all these other factors. I just think it's overkill for what you're trying to do. And a lot of people would probably win shows on less gear. They wouldn't like, I think they're when you over gear, you you've probably seen this too with a lot of people that they spill over because you know, your adrenal glands can only take so much stress before they're like, fuck off. Mm-hmm. And yeah. your body just doesn't do what you want it to do. And then you think, oh, they're not working. So you try and put more gear in there and your body is just not accepting it. No, definitely a subject I want to circle back to later when we talk about the supplementation is the cortisol aspect of prep and how people handle that. But before we get off muscle growth, one of the things people think pros address that maybe the average person doesn't have access to or whatever, myostatin inhibitors. I knew knew you were going to fucking say (laughs) So... (laughs) Is this, have you ever tried legitimate folostatin and, or do you know anyone who has, and what do you think about myostatin inhibition in a fully grown adult? Because for me, what I've seen personally, when I dug into the research is Belgian blues, these like myostatin deficient Mm -hmm. rodents, you see like an increase in the muscle fiber content as a consequence of it, like in development like pre being born, like literally the actual development of the infrastructure of the animal is the myostatin deficiency results in more muscle fibers. They can then hypertrophy Mm -hmm. like after they're born, essentially, as opposed to like when you're a full grown adult, it's like if you hammered yourself with GH when you're 25 years old, you're not going to grow like five inches in height or something. (laughs) So like for me, I don't, I don't know if there's any utility to like a fall or something in a full grown like bodybuilder. Like what have you seen personally? So I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, but maybe not everyone does know. The, the studies that use the fall statin have a, a virus, a viral vector, which means that it's in a virus that is specifically designed to bind in your DNA. And that way you're actually changing the expression of a gene where just taking statin is not doing the same thing. So like the studies that use the, the viral vector, what well, that's how it gets into the DNA. That's how it blocks the expression of that protein and your body does grow. And that is a real thing. And I've, and I don't know how real this is, but I've spoken to bodybuilders and coaches that claim they have like chem, chemists in, you know, let's say another country or whatever that actually make the vector viral or the viral vector um, compound, they claim that it, like they have that and it's super expensive and they claim that it works. Most of the shit that's on the market is just, you know, or it's probably bunk, but like it's just labeled as false statin and that is not gonna do anything for you. It needs the virus to get into your DNA for it to work. 
Damn. So, so these people that are cl- like anecdotes from these are top bodybuilders <laughs> claiming that they're getting like a significant enhancement out of adding this on top of everything else. Like they've already, they've peaked out on anabolic <laughs> exposure, GH insulin, and then they add this viral vector based fall like thing on top of it and then they mm-hmm. achieve like an extra boost and this is all like anecdotal like i said but yes yeah and uh i mean it you would have to have super high connections to a lab or have your own lab where you can make this because to have a viral vector that's expensive technology and it's not just something that you could you know whip up in your house or in a homemade yeah. lab so the, the odds of getting that are super slim. Once that's introduced into your system, though, and you've like altered DNA, is that something you can then walk back? Because it's like with gear, obviously, if I am all of a sudden I have like brutal cardiomegaly, I have plaque buildup, I have all these things that I'm like, okay, I got to fix my, I got to not be a part of this lifestyle anymore. And I want to just come off and go to like baseline TRT or whatever it is. You can walk that back. But if you've altered your DNA, with this viral vector is that something you can then walk back or are you permanently altered well uh the studies that they that you're uh, let's walk back for a second like the the mice that they do the studies with those Mm -hmm. you're familiar with like what knockout genes are and stuff yeah they knock out the gene that encodes for myostatin right right so they're they're born without that gene this drug is inhibiting the expression of it so I think over time, as your DNA is replicated, it will be, it'll last for a long time, but I don't think it's something that will last forever mm-hmm. because you, you know, at some point your DNA will be, you know, there'll be a mutation or something will happen where it's not being replicated. It's the same way. Uh, but the, I mean, the studies show for, um, what is it? ACE 1031 or something. Yeah, one, yeah. one of those, I forgot the acronym. I think it's 031. I think that's correct. Yeah. Okay. The study in, it was in women, and they took one dose on like day one, and it lasted over four weeks. So I hmm. think the ability—if you're taking something multiple times—I think that it's a very real that will last for a long time. And you could have stuff where like your heart grows that you don't want to, or other things grow. But if you are, I, I think if you are born that way, if you had a knockout gene or a low ex- expression of it. I don't think that I've seen the mice or cows have huge hearts and it'd be an issue. Hmm. Yeah. The thing I always question with the myostatin thing, like I understand the logic for it, but at the same time, any of the studies I've seen that actually monitor the myostatin levels, not just after they spike from the introduction of super physiological androgens, but if they follow it, the trend of it, it seems to go up. And then it actually goes back to baseline, even while the drugs are in the system still. So I like, I wonder if that's the actual like inhibiting protein that is actually problematic at the end of the day. I don't know. Like a lot, I guess if guys are using these viral vectors and seeing progress out of it, then you can't argue with that if that was actually what's happening. But like from the data I've seen, the myostatin, it, it doesn't seem to sustain itself at this higher level. It seems to go up when you use androgens. And then if you stay on the androgens, it actually goes back down to some extent. So I don't know. You mean goes, you mean myostatin goes down? Cause it's. Yeah. 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 Like I forget yeah, which, which study it was, it might've even been in like a graded dose response study in humans. I don't quote me on this. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there was a study literally assessing it was like on a super physiological dose of test, I believe. And it showed that myostatin went up. And then months later, while on the same drug, it they went back to baseline, even though eight weeks before that, it was like up here and went from baseline to up here and then back down while on the same cycle. So. you Wait, are you saying falostatin went up? Because if no, myostatin my, goes my, up, my, myostatin. Myostatin, yeah, but if that goes up then your body is going to break, not build muscle. Is yeah, exactly. Right? So like so, the, the, uh, the thing that people assert is that if you're on a cycle after like, I don't know, six to eight weeks or something, yeah, my, yeah. myostatin yeah. elevates to prevent yes. you from growing too much. Mm-hmm. And then your compounds are essentially ineffective because you have such high myostatin that it's preventing you from growing. Right. But, I but what I, so what I'm saying is this study that I saw, I'll send it to you after and then you can let me know what you think because I might be misquoting and like very poorly representing what it was because it's been a couple of years since I saw it, but it was myostatin levels elevated 
to a degree where you would probably, if you just saw this peak, you would be like, oh, like that's why people stop growing. Right. But then the, the levels went back to baseline, even staying on the same steroids. How what was the time factor? Do you it was like that? four months or something. So it was like, but again, might be wrong. I'll send you the study <laughs> after and we can revisit it. So this is just yeah. like me and you discussing something I find interesting. Not audience, don't like fucking hold me to these stats. <laughs> so like, it was like eight weeks or something. Myostatin cranked up. And then after another four, uh, eight weeks or something, it went back to baseline, even though the same dose of test was in play. So That's interesting. I definitely want to read that because I do think that, yes, it definitely gets spiked up when you, as part of like the counteraction of your body, you know, reacting to all these androgens thrown at it. But I would love to see it go back down after a certain amount, because that would mean that your drugs should be working more or you're in a, you should be more in an anabolic state. So that's interesting. Okay. But yeah. I'm going like, to find that. I'm going to pause the video and find the study because I don't want this to be a, I want to be able to actually provide feedback in real time. So one sec. <laughs> okay. So, so for the people who are following, by the way, this is us looking at this for the first, for me, the first time in years again. And this is the first time um, you've seen it ever, presumably. So yeah. <laughs> measurement of myostatin concentrations in human serum, circulating concentrations in young and older men and effects of testosterone administration. So the graph we're looking at, and I'll try, I'll do my best to remember to edit this onto the screen. If I don't, that is the study name, if you want to go look at it yourself. But basically, we're on page 30, and it shows two graphs. This is changes in myostatin levels in young men in response to administration of graded doses of testosterone. You can see on day zero, it's around eight nanograms per milliliter. And then by day 56, we're at almost 10 ish. Like I'm sure I could actually yeah. find a real number if I read the full like text, but just ballpark like 10. And then at day 140, instead of what you would expect when you're on testosterone, that it would continue to go up or stay the same to prevent you from building more muscle, it goes almost back down to baseline. So like, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is interesting because so if, if you're looking at this and you don't know how to read a study at all, those error bars kind of show you the precision of the measurement. So it's plus or minus a certain amount. And so it looks like if you take that into account, they, the day zero and the day 140 are very, very close to each other. And, and it would say if it was st statistically significant or not, and it doesn't say that. It only says that the day uh, 56 is. So if I'm reading this correctly, it does match what you're saying as far as it looks like they go up and then about about half a little less than halfway in and then they, they start to go back down i wish they had some more data points like in between there yeah you know, like obviously they, if they, we weren't live on a podcast we could actually read through the study fully and have a way more like conclusive and informed answer so don't please don't take this as <laughs> like like we could be talking out of our ass right now but like from what i could see here it says it said myostatin levels were not not significantly associated with lean body mass in either young or older men in response to testosterone administration. So like for me, I'm interpreting that it had no impact on lean body mass outcomes where you would otherwise assert, if I'm on a cycle by week eight, my myostatin is so high that I can't make gains anymore. So now I either need to increase the dose or an old myth that people used to think was <laughs> switch the compound and you're like tricking, the, switching, <laughs> you're tricking the myostatin or whatever. <laughs> But I don't know, like, it's weird, because it's like, this is a theory that gets circulated a lot is it goes up. And that's what's stopping you from growing. But I think there are other things at play that are like counter regulatory feedback systems. And it's not just the myostatin thing. I, I agree with you, your body is super complex. And it will to, to not sound cheesy, but to quote, like Jurassic Park, like nature finds a way your body will figure out yeah. at some point, it's you're not just going to keep growing, your body's going to say, Okay, you want to increase testosterone, I'm going to increase cortisol, or I'm going to increase yeah. estrogen, or I'm going to stop you from doing this because I want to get back to homeostasis. I like where we are. And you, you can go from here to here in like eight weeks, your body is going to like say, okay, we want you back down here. So what, how do I do that? It's like releasing catabolic things. Yeah. So, so when you're dieting aggressively, it's not just like, like the amount of hormones that get mm -hmm. thrown off to try and keep you from starving, like your thyroid goes down all of your androgens, then your actual fertility metrics start crashing, cortisol levels go through the fucking, like there's so many things that are at play that I think it would be impossible to just chalk up 
yeah. hindrance of growth on a cycle to myostatin <laughs> elevation for sure I, I agree with that i mean that's like that's like saying you could pinpoint that the addition of anovar in your eight compound cycle is, is what's making you grow or something like it's not discernible yeah. but this this study uh i'll definitely read it more we can have like a circle back to this because okay i haven't seen this and uh derek just put me on the spot by the way so <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't take anything we said as like like a high level interpretation of it that was like a cursory glance but yeah it's, me, it's cool it is very cool and i'll read i'll read the study and then we'll get a more definitive answer on this but it is that's that's kind of what it's saying in a nutshell for sure yeah what are your thoughts on Incurlex versus underground lab igf1 lr3 and desk <laughs> okay so I've talked about this before and um, Patrick Arnold, who was like my main influence on why to go to school for chemistry and do what I do. He also talked about this. So you have these binding proteins that IGF goes to and it needs to bind to them to work. Mm -hmm. If you add this um, LR3, like you change the, to the arginine, so it doesn't bind and it, it has a quote longer half-life. It's just cause it's like circulating in your body. It's floating mm -hmm. around but it hasn't once it ba is bound to those proteins that's when it actually works so i think that the you you can't the lr3 i think is garbage i think that's why the prescription ones are not lr3 because people have this myth that the lr3 just stays in your system longer but it, it's really just like i said it's it's in your system but it's not doing anything because it's not activated essentially mm -hmm. so like the um the des is kind of mimicking actual, actual igf one versus the lr3 and i think that if you don't have that it it, it actually works but you increlex is not lr3 if i'm correct right it's just igf1 yeah i'm pretty sure it's just recombinant igf1 mm -hmm. unless i am it's for that right i'm pretty sure it's for that reason because yeah, recombinant LR3, I, igf1 yeah yeah because it, the the LR3, like I said, it's it's not going to bind to the proteins, and it has to in order for it to work. But DES does. Like I, this is, it's been a long time since I've revisited the whole peptides. Peptides, I know. Me too. I'm trying to think which one is like mechanical growth factor and which one is mm -hmm. the DES. If they're the same, um, I do remember that they the ones that have like the the binding complex, those worked better than the ones without it i forgot what it was the domain binding the what are those peptides with the the binding complex on them oh like the one or the other oh, mod, mod grf 129 versus cjc 1295 with DAC, drug, DAC. drug affinity complex that, dac yeah yes i do think that the dac has good data to show that it helps with the binding to the receptor versus not yeah, that was actually IGF. the only peptide I've seen be able to reproduce like pharma grade HGH levels was using CJC1295 DAC plus like MK677. People were achieving like 500, 600 IGF1 levels, mm -hmm. and, which is like, you know, pretty Retarded. fucking hot. Yeah. 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 So I don't know, like some of the stuff definitely works, but the IGF1 thing, like I never at a high level, like the, what I recall from a cursory glance was like LR3 is long acting, DES is super short, and it's very unclear if either of them actually do anything. I, I've never seen any proof that the LR3 does anything and actually mm -hmm. um, elevates IGF, but um, the CJC and MK677 do for sure, because I got blood work done taking MK677 and my I think my levels were almost like 300, which is mm -hmm. pretty elevated for um, not, you know, not having a growth hormone issue. Yeah. So I, you know, I know that stuff works. It's just, um, I don't think they, that I definitely don't think that L LR3 works at all. I think it's a scam. Now in Curlex, have you ever tried it or know people who've tried it and what was their feedback? I have never seen it in person. Okay. I, I just know it's, super expensive. And the only time I've ever seen somebody use it, I think was like when Rich Piano was using it in his videos, mm. bodybuilders have like said that they use it, but, um, and people, some people swear by it and they say a very small amount does a huge difference. But again, 
how much of a difference, how, how do you know what's really working when you're taking so many things? It's very hard to decipher what is actually doing something. Unless you add something in, like later on, like you did the exact same cycle, like months later and added that mm -hmm. in, that's really the only way you could tell if that actually did something. The thing that would sketch me out the most with Incrolex is the fact that you're, like, I guess the same thing happens with any steroid is like you're bypassing the right limiting step of the synthesis of the hormone. Like your body is only going to be able to spit out so much testosterone through lighting cell stimulation before you have like cancer or something in your balls. <laughs> with Incrolex, it's like, with GH, you at least know that there's like a feed, a system whereby mm -hmm. growth factor production is like halted at, at a point at some point. Yeah. And like, even if you're trying to push that vector, it's a little bit more of a sketchy vector, I would say from a hyperplasia mode of action relative to like a driving like muscle protein synthesis directly aspect through AR agonism. So like, I'm thinking if you're trying to compare using like high dose pharma GH or something or generic and you're getting your IGF-1 up to like 400, 500, 600 and all of the satellite growth factors that you get out of that mm. GH right. versus just straight IGF-1 hammering your system with who knows how much of a, like, I don't know what dose equates to what, like, is you using Incrolex at a low dose, the equivalent of having like a 2000 like IGF-1? Like, I don't really know. <laughs> it's almost like the HCG thing over again. So it seems like, the responsible not that it's responsible but like gh seems like more reasonable than to try and push igf1 singularly i don't know right but your body has a regulatory system for gh and at some point it will stop producing it will stop converting gh to igf1 yeah. uh, that, that we know that that's like studied and stuff so that's you don't the people who are worried about like heart growth and like left ventricle hardening and stuff like that I would not suggest taking IGF-1 because that does not have a feedback loop. That is just going straight to your system. Yeah. Where at least where like where you said growth hormone still has to convert to IGF-1 in order for it to, to elicit those effects. And your body does have a regulatory system for that. Yeah, I forget which study it was, but I saw a study on nortitropin dosages and it was like upwards of 20 IUs a day or something. And at, at like, once you got to like 700, 800 IGF-1, your body could not really like spit out more. It kind of just like shut itself off in terms of spitting yeah. out more growth factor. So per, like, I don't know what Incrolex equates to from like a equivalency aspect of egoism right. of different processes, but it seems a lot more as if having an 800 IGF wasn't sketchy enough, like in, who knows what Incrolex is doing, right? Yeah, I just think if you're worried about side effects, uh, mm -hmm. especially like heart side effects and cancer, like IGF-1 levels are directly correlated to cancer or elevated levels. So yeah. you don't want it. You don't want to do anything that's going to cause that. Like there used to be like a myth of like GH can cause cancer. Well, no, GH can make it grow, but like IGF-1 can actually is correlated to um cancer a higher risk of cancer sorry yeah and for the actual like when it comes to generic versus pharma grade gh2 what do you think in terms of if you have a high quality generic aside from purity let's just say the actual content of it is like enough like i've seen you know like the same equivalency of igf1 metrics on paper when people check their IGF-1 from generic versus Chick pharma, but there will still be a people who claim like it's night and day difference. Some people who claim there's no difference if you have a high quality generic. Do you have an experience or opinion on that? There's the problem is there's just so much fake shit out there, right? So you mm. never, it, you know, if I give you a vial, an unmarked vial of HCG and an unmarked vial of GH, would you be able to really tell the difference? Or mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like you never know. And, and then like you hear um, stories of like China that is spiking GH with um, the compound that induces wa water retention. Antidiuretic so hormone or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So that way it's, so you think it's working because you're retaining water. So the good old rip tropins. Yes. So I, I think if you can get pharma, I think pharma is always the way to go. If you get a generic from like an actual pharmacy or a compounding mm -hmm. pharmacy, it should be on the same level. Like Sarah stems are, you know, the, the gold standard, but they're so, they're faked so much and like really, really good fakes. 
So I just, I don't know. The only time I've ever messed with GH is I actually, it had this, the sticker from the pharmacy like ripped off and you could still see part of it, just mm. like the name and stuff. So that's why I just knew it was real. Um, other than that, I, I just don't trust any of that stuff. So you've never used generics yourself? Uh, no. Oh, okay. What was your experience with the uh, pharma? Honestly, I didn't think it did a whole lot. Um, I was using, I think four I use a day and I was doing it first thing in the morning. And, you know, some people claim it doesn't do anything until you hit like eight or 10 or something. <laughs> I use uh, a day, yeah. uh, but, um, and then, and it's not this like mythical thing where you could eat whatever you want and you stay yeah. in. like, that's complete garbage. I don't yeah. know how that got started, but that is not the case. No, definitely not. Yeah. Um, so I didn't notice a huge difference versus taking it over versus taking it out. It'd be interesting to see like if I got like a DEXA scan before and after, like what the results were, but it wasn't enough to justify spending the money on it to mm. for the results. Yeah, it's wild how drastically different the opinions are of how well <laughs> it works. Cause some people they claim it's like the best thing ever. And then some people it's mm -hmm. an expensive fat burner. And at some point, it's like, it's almost not even like an expensive fat burner. Like there are way better fat burners that are way yeah. better at what they're like. This is something that the lipolysis aspect, you still have to go like burn the fatty acids. It's not like you just burn it by using the GH. So right. a lot of people, I think, misinterpret and they think your like metabolic rate like goes up significantly when you use it, which just is not the case. No. But the actual like hyperplasia hypothesis behind using it is that people think that they're going to split muscle cells, which then they can induce new hypertrophy in and kind of like raise their potential from like uh, what you can get at your anabolic standpoint. And it's kind of up in the air. It seems like not really anybody can conclusively say that it's actually worthwhile to be using. It's kind of I interesting don't... how people abuse the fuck out of it still. Like <laughs> when it's like, it's clearly like very, very impactful on like cardiovascular health too. So yeah. I, I don't think there's been anything that really shows that it, it has that effect one way or the other. I think, I don't think that it does personally. Mm. Um, and I just, it's definitely not, like I said, like a miracle drug and it's definitely doesn't increase your metabolic rate. Like maybe it, it releases like fatty acids into your blood to mm -hmm. be, you know, metabolized and, and kicked out, but it's not like, increase it's not like taking thyroid hormone that's increasing your rate your thyroid rate so i i don't think it's worth it i talked to some people that you know love it at that 8 10 iu range 12 ius i know pros that have, that take like a bottle of them every day of sero a day when it comes to prep so like i think that you know how people are like creatures of habit i think mm -hmm. it's just one of those those things where like, I need halo to get hard or I need interrupt yeah. for this. It's like, I need GH to get ripped kind of thing or to, or to induce hyperplasia. I think that's like, that's some myth that was started in like the nineties when nobody knew anything about growth hormone and there were no studies out or anything. I think just people just got that idea, but I don't think that hyperplasia is actually really hard to induce. It's mm. not, I don't think that, you know, a low dose of, growth hormone is significantly or even like a moderate is going to significantly increase hyperplasia you have i haven't seen a study showing that yet yeah i'm not discounting that it might help like mechanistically downstream like maybe not the other growth factors and other things that contribute to some heightened level of bodybuilding capacity when in conjunction with uh anabolics too but i'm just saying from the studies i've seen on naturals of course up to 18 IU of Cero stem had like no impact on actual contractile yeah. tissue. It was all like lean body mass outcomes from like seemingly like water and like things yeah. that can't be accounted for otherwise. So I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of up in the air on that still, but I think, uh, I don't know, like people, some people swear by it. Some people think it's useless, but I think it's just good to have that, the transparency around that it's, might probably oftentimes not worth the money and it's definitely not a fountain of youth as is no. suggested <laughs> like if anything you might be expediting your age chrono like biologically i think by using it if there was if you were like getting this hyperplasia outcome out of it like i feel like you're just expediting your time frame to cellular senescence like you know 
Yeah, this whole anti-aging thing, I really, I mean, that study was done in like people that didn't work out or anything, right? So mm -hmm. if you induce some type of anabolic, you're, you're going to put on some muscle if you've been doing nothing, you know? Yeah. So I don't, I mean, that, that's how you take a study and put it way out of context. And so yeah. everyone reads that and they say like gains eight pounds, loses six pounds of fat, like in whatever, how amount of time. Yeah, they probably can do that on somebody who's never taken a single thing and has never exercised. And just by like manipulating hormones, you mm -hmm. can do that. But for someone that's been training for like years and has taken all these other things, your body's adapted. And I don't think that you'll ever have those type of claims from a GH or from someone taken. Yeah. I just don't think it's possible. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting about your research is as far as I know, you're one of the only like forefront chemist that you know talks about this stuff openly who also was like in the lab literally researching SARMs and development so I've seen your opinions on them at like your general findings seem to be that you think at a low dose they have efficacy in a clinical context and maybe even I don't know like performance enhancement context could you speak to that at all of like what you found in your research do you think they're a promising class of compounds and do you still follow the research as they're developing? Um, I think that there's, I think that at a low dose for sure, they, that's what they're meant for. Like a low dose, they bind to the receptor, activate it without, you know, being hormonal effective. But the higher the dose, there seems to be a correlation between like a shutdown of LH and testosterone production with SARMs and while something is super anabolic, like say LGD, it's also super suppressive. And we don't know a whole lot about it where like testosterone we know has been studied for 20 years. So there's a risk there for like, by taking this compound an elevated dose, but like Austrian was, I think studied at three milligrams. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once SARMs came out, people started making capsules with like 30 milligrams. And anytime you're taking 10 times the dose that's studied, there's going to be side effects and issues. Plus, these are very like selectively binding, like where their name comes from, right? So like these chemicals are made so to like bind in that receptor pocket and uh, just like how testosterone is. So they're like, they have functional groups that bind to specific parts of the enzyme and then activate it. Whereas um, it's, like when you do the hormonal thing, your body metabolizes it much differently than it does the sun. So like you're almost competing for the androgen receptor binding if you stack the two. It's like people hit me up all the time asking like, can I stack like like 30 milligrams or 10 milligrams of this with you know, testosterone? I was like, you can, but if you took a lower dose, you'll probably get much better results because it binds very tightly and you could possibly prevent of the testosterone or whatever you're taking binding to the androgen receptor because the SARMs are so selective and so like their functional groups bind so tightly to the enzyme mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah yeah so for do you still follow the research like as they develop so, or um i'm a little behind on them i know like i've spoken to tony huge he's asked me about some stuff and put things on my radar but uh i haven't followed some of the newer stuff that's out somebody hit messaged me the other day saying if i think it was like is there a rad 150 versus 140 <laughs> yeah, yeah i've heard of that yeah and I, I was like i don't i haven't seen anything on rad 150 yet but like there's there are tons of compounds that have yeah. never even hit the research chemical market yet you know like the cool thing about the sarms is so like from a chemist standpoint it's called a uh, SAR, like structural activity relationship. So like you know the structure of the androgen receptor and you know where what, what amino acid residues are on each pocket and you know where to put like a halogen, like a fluoride or where to put like a ring or, or methyl group. So like where it's more greasy and hydrophobic, you put a methyl group and it'll bind more tightly where if you have more polar amino acids, you put like a halogen and then it will have these things called um, hydrogen bonds, which will make the molecule bind to the enzyme and then the enzyme activate uh, or bind more tightly. So SARMs are like designed to do this much more effectively than say testosterone is. The thing I've seen at least personally is that at low doses, like you said, they're effective, but 
their ceiling for anabolic activity seems to be much lower. So it's like, and in addition, their tissue selectivity seems to be, I guess, somewhat similar to synthetic anabolic steroids, which were designed to be more right. tissue selective than testosterone. Like that's the whole point they were made to begin with is for like the androgen sensitive children, people who need burn, it. Burn, burn victims. Yeah. Like, like, like yeah. yeah. So like clinically giving a burn victim an Anavar versus like a test, like obviously you're going to viralize a chick less <laughs> with a Anavar than a comparable amount of test. So the SARMs, like I understand their utility, but like from a bodybuilding or like performance enhancement perspective, it seems like the way they differ mainly from synthetic anabolic steroids is when you crank the dose up, they don't necessarily linearly produce progress. Now, obviously steroids, there's a dose diminishing response as well, mm -hmm. where like, even if you look at the studies in humans, like 600 tests versus 300, you don't get a doubling of results. Each time you bump the dose, you get like a, like a chopping of like part of the increase in lean body mass outcome and strength. Right. To a point where it's like, you know, increasing the dose is almost nonsensical at a certain point for the ROI and the risk profile. With SARMs, it seems like that like threshold is even lower though. It's like you get a very, very potent effect at a low milligram amount proportional to the actual input of the drug. But as you start to get to like, I don't know, like 50 to 100 milligrams of LGD, it's not like you get 50x the response that you did right. at one milligram kind of thing. I agree with you on that. Like, I think, I think 10 milligrams is way too much of LGD. And I know people, you know, people ask me about all the time about signs and like, if you can and you trust it, get a liquid one so you can measure yourself. Like, because someone's making a certain amount in a capsule that I think is way beyond what you should be taking and what you need to take. Like, to, I think a little bit goes a long way with signs. And like you were saying, uh, they're more selective. And I do think that they have and especially anabolic properties that maybe some of the other like hormonal compounds don't have in the side effects, but there's no perfect SARM yet, right? Like we haven't, we, I mean, like the science community hasn't made a perfect anabolic with zero androgenic. And that's the path that SARMs are on, but it has not happened yet. And while they may be getting closer, and I do think therapeutically at some point, they will get closer and that will be the go-to drug for, you know, age patients and burn victims and stuff like that. I don't think they're, they'll be like the, the TRT type of drug. Yeah. And I think, but I think they're going to have a place in, um, in pharmacy for sure. Now, as far as women, like I see this as the, from a performance and en enhancement aspect, it seems like the population that may otherwise have the most utility if they were to leverage this in like a non-clinical setting. So typically females are often quick to jump to a thing like, you know, an Anavar <laughs> or uh, something that maybe they should have otherwise used like creatine and like basic shit before they got there. And that's like a whole nother discussion about <laughs> all the natural shit you could do before you got to the steroids. And you probably don't even need the steroids to begin with for being like a, a bikini competitor. Bikini. I was just going to say bikini. Yeah. But like, let's just say girls who are trying to like push the envelope or whatever, or even, I don't know, like uh, just people who are like hypersensitive to androgens in general, do you see certain SARMs as like superior, not as like an overall anabolic maybe, but like for the, the viralization component, do you see like an LGD as a low dose as maybe a better option than like an Anavar or what are your thoughts on that? I absolutely think that a low dose Austrian mm -hmm. was, is much safer than taking an Anavar for women. And I've firsthand like seen women take SARMs and it worked really well. Bikini, it's funny, we mentioned bikini, but I've seen bikini athletes use them and uh, use them at the right low dose and they've worked really well. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't get the virilization that you get from taking a male androgen, right? Yeah. So I, if, if I were coaching a woman who's especially not in like physique or bodybuilding, somebody that's in bikini, that just needs a little bit of muscle that if they've already exhausted like we talked about all the natural stuff, I would 100% recommend a low dose of a SARM versus uh, a, an androgen. Now of the SARMs, do you think Austrian at a low dose is superior to like one or two milligrams of LGD, for example, or any of the other options? Like what do you see as, like obviously Austrian is the most studied overall, mm -hmm. but yeah. like what is that 
kind of the one you would defer to because of that? Or like, what are your thoughts in general of efficacy? That me personally, that's, I'm deferring to, it has the most research Mm -hmm. because there's always going to be something that comes out and has really good preliminary research. And then you find out later, like, oh, this kills your liver or this gives you cholesterol or heart attacks or something, right? So I would rather use something that's more studied in humans because some, I don't even think there's a human study in LGD. I think, I don't even think there's a RAD study in, in humans. And there's some of the newer- LGD and RAD have human studies now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like when they first came out though, they did not. No, no, yeah. And, and people were taking- like large amounts of them without knowing anything. Yeah. So uh, it's I'm glad that, that they have human studies out and they're getting some type of research. But anecdotally, Austrian has worked really well in both men and women from what I've seen. And so that's kind of, it's my go-to for those two reasons. One, it has the most research. And two, I've seen it, like how it reacts with you, your body and with other people's bodies. Okay. So going, this is going to be a fun one. We're talking about supplementation, beta alanine, our favorite ingredient. (laughs) So I think I've like sort of, okay. So like I am not, to me, there's not really a utility for it because I don't do endurance sports. So put that as a preface. So when I talk about pre-workout ingredients, I'm typically talking in the context of like acute performance outcomes in like a eight to 12 rep or eight to 15 rep scenario. And for me, beta alanine, especially for the ROI on the uncomfortability of my entire workout to where I'm driving to the gym, scratching my face, scratching my legs, everywhere that gets itchy. I kind of made this, this joke that has kind of picked up a lot of steam that it's like the itchy butthole ingredient. Cause like, you'll be, (laughs) you'll be sitting at the bench or wherever you're working out and like all, it doesn't actually really give you like, I find it more on your face and like your feet ears too yeah the paresthesia is pretty bad Mm -hmm. on the face and the feet especially so for me like with shoes on trying to scratch your foot like while your foot is in a shoe at the gym and looking like a like a crackhead like scratching your face (laughs) and stuff it's just not a comfortable ingredient for me at all like i've grown to despise it and the fact that like even when i used to use other companies pre-workouts before i came out with my own it sucked when i would see the profile of everything was what I wanted. And then it also had beta alanine. And I had to just deal with the paresthesia I didn't want in order to get the rest of the profile. So like, I always, yeah. I always like swore, swore against using it in my like main pre-workout that I came out with, but per, you can like, I've spoken on it at length, but I would love for you to elucidate your thoughts on it and preface. It's not an ineffective ingredient. If you're using it for the purposes outlined and you actually use it properly frequently but I'll let you give your opinion on it. Right. So anyone that knows me and follows me knows that I fucking hate beta <laughs> for, for all the same reasons that you just mentioned. Yeah. yeah. And especially the fact that I think a lot of supplement companies use it to, for the old, I can feel it working mm. thing. Right. So like mm. some people used to use niacin to flush so that your body feels something going on. Mm. But, but if you, but like you said, you look at the data, the buildup period, is 100, 160 grams, right? 79, so t- I think. 100, 179, yeah. yeah. So you taking your 3.2 grams before you work out isn't gonna do anything acutely. You have to take, I think that the 6.4 came from taking that- um, For 28 twice, days or something. 28, yeah, that's where that whole 6.4 came. So like this clinical dose of 3.2 is not the clinical dose, it's half the clinical dose and you're, you're only getting a buildup, I think, of 20% carnison for like just wanting to rip your face off in the gym. I don't think the trade off <laughs> is worth it. Yeah. And I think that you can get much more effective ways. Like, I really like Pico too. Okay. It sucks that it tastes like shit. Yeah. Because it's just a bunch of mushrooms. But I think that it, that it works really well. I had, and it had it in my initial pre workout, and then flavoring became a huge issue with it. Mm. So I had to take it out, but I really like it um for that purpose and I, I think that mushrooms in general have a lot of good properties for endurance stuff and mm. i th- i think that's like the route to go i i don't think beta alanine i mean if like if you're doing what the study says and you're taking 6.4 grams for 28 days you might notice a difference on like a endurance thing right yeah but you're not going to notice a, any difference taking 
even if you take 6.4 grams before you go to the gym, which is super intolerable for most people. Yeah. So, like, like I would argue the only reason, one of the reasons I don't like it is because I feel like it should be like, you could make the same argument for creatine though. Like why would I have creatine in my pre-workout because it's one of the best ergogenic aids there are. And I'm basically saving somebody from having to buy it separately. And even though it doesn't have an acute effect, like you're basically building up your creatine stores by taking it in my product. And I'm kind of like, I feel like doing two birds, one stone. Cause you'd have to be taking it anyways elsewhere with beta alanine though. It's like creatine is something that actually aids in performance outcomes in the gym in the context in which people are using pre-workout. So I'm just, for me, skeptical that if you're an endurance athlete, that's actually trying to get what you want to get out of beta alanine, that you'd be taking a pre-workout before like, do you think anyone takes pre-workouts with heavy stimulants and shit before doing like a cycling like event? A race? I don't know. Like, it seems like a bunch of citrulline and caffeine and this and that. Like, I don't, I, it just seems to me the utility, utility of it would be more so in like a, like an endurance pre-workout or something, something that's like actually focused for that rather than like acute stimulatory, like force production outcomes. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think there's any, uh, and I, I get in this argument a lot. I don't think there's acute benefits from from it i don't um i think that if you're gonna if you're gonna get anything from it it's something that's gonna happen taking it over time caffeine obviously is something that's cute and you feel right away and so people notice that and and people love things they can feel like yeah. if it's um excitatory it's not like people love to have some type of feeling when they think that they associate that with it working so I personally don't like beta alanine. I don't think it does anything acutely. I agree with you 100% on everything that you've said so far about it. And I'm very public about that. Like I purposely, it was my main goal was not to put it in any of my products and not to put it in my pre-workout. And um, the itching, I just, the paresthesia, I just fucking hate it. And I don't know how yeah. people love it. So I people, it tends to be like younger kids that I talk to, but they love it. Yeah. No, yeah. It's like, I guess there could be a placebo effect of the itchiness too. Like if you feel like a sense of urgency from like the itchiness in your face, like maybe you're a bit more aggressive on the weights. Like, I don't really know, but like for me, it's kind of like, and there's definitely an argument to be made though, too, from like the devil's advocate approach is that there's probably a level of enhancement to your endurance that you get before you reach 179 grams. So even if I was taking 3.2 a day, in my pre-workout five days a week, if I was even going to take it that much, I don't know if everyone takes pre-workout that often. I don't necessarily <laughs> recommend taking like 350 milligrams of caffeine that often or whatever, but anyways, <laughs> taking it like that, like even if I got to like 79 grams of saturation, like I haven't reached the outcome that actually yields like a clinically significant outcome from the data that we've had elucidated, but maybe there's like, if I got 1% versus the two to three that you get at 179 grams, maybe that's worthwhile to the people who don't care about the paresthesia or like it. So like, there's right. definitely, it's not just like you either, even with creatine, it's not like you hit five yeah. grams or nothing. Yeah. There's, there's some in between where you get something out of it still. That's right. Worse. But like, so, you know, that 179 grams was the 20% increase. So if you mm -hmm. were half that, you may have 10% increase. And like, it's, it's not, they, I don't think they published all of the, the data to show, like, I think they just, found that that was the amount of time it got 20 percent but mm -hmm. i agree with you that it logically it could help you a little bit along the way but it's still going to take a decent amount like yeah. that 3.2 on day one isn't going to do anything it's probably not going to do anything on day 10 or day 20 it might start to do stuff on like day 30 you know after taking that for a month straight and i wonder what the clearance time is too so it's like if i was only taking it like realistically how many times a week are people taking pre-workout maybe like four or five times max i would say of your like max. heavy caffeine lead in uh, pre-workout so like if i was taking if you had like people would consider like a good dose pre-workout with beta alanine like 3.2 grams or more so let's just say we have a 3200 milligram pre-workout and we took it four days a week and i'm getting mm -hmm. up to like i don't know 13 14 grams per week those days I have off, am I clearing an amount out that is like dragging me below, you know, like, I don't know what the buildup even looks like to, to be able to assert that you're getting like an in-between effect if you're not taking it every single fucking day. So I just think the best way to utilize it would be like as a separate supplement, like specifically for endurance purposes, if you were to look 
to want that. But I yeah, I think I think that you made a good point that I don't think the data shows that if you when, when if you skip days in between, are you is your your levels would probably lower. I don't know by what percent, and I don't know how much your carnison levels, which was what really matters, yeah, would, would change. I do know that the reason, the whole reason beta alanine is a thing in a, is because the two amino acids that form carnosine are histidine and beta alanine. And they, they first thought that you could, if you ingested histidine, it would increase um, carnosine, but it doesn't, but beta alanine does. So that's the other cool thing about chemistry is like, if you have a molecule that's made of two amino acids and you try to increase it with one, it didn't work. So you try the other. And now it's like a huge supplement that it, that's in like every pre-workout. Yeah, it's like the weird paradoxical relationship between if you take arginine to increase arginine levels, and then you'd actually Citru be better yeah. off taking citrulline instead, even though like you're trying even to increase arginine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Weird how that stuff works. It is. It's cool, though. I like yeah. I like that stuff. Yeah. Fat loss aids. So there is a like we talked about GH and it's, you know, probably overrated lipolytic effects. Um, like it does what it's supposed to do, I guess. It's just people expect a lot more out of it than they can get. And I don't think they realize they actually have to do activity to like capitalize on the lipolysis. Right. Like from, I think there are a lot of fat burners that excel far above what GH can produce for you. So there's things like, you know, beta two agonists, you have like your clen, mm -hmm. you have, you know, actual caffeine for a face. Yeah. You yeah. have uh, ephedrine, you have, um, Alpha two adrenergic receptor antagonists like uh, yohimbine and rabulcine. Mm -hmm. So for you, and then there's like insulin sensitivity agents, GDAs, um, cortisol. GC1. Yeah, GC one and cortisol lowering. Yeah, yeah. Like there's so many fucking things that could be addressed. Like, what do you see as the lowest hanging fruit of fat burning agents? Whether that's from a appetite suppressing context to allow you to adhere to your deficit or increasing your energy expenditure or stimulants that just like crank your fucking sympathetic drive and like like what do you see as the lowest hanging fruit if you were to be in a a dieting phase you're like okay i've plateaued from what i can tolerate from increasing cardio and decreasing food like now i'm going to introduce pharmacology like what are your main like layering effects of what you're adding in well i think i'm pretty sure you have a mode in one of your products right yeah. And speaking, we're going to talk about that shortly about <laughs> cortisol and, yeah. or we could talk about it now. Yeah. I think that is something that I, I don't know if anybody talked about it before you, but it was something that partly I was educated on, on your material. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, I was going to ask you that not to like, say, did you copy me? Cause that's not what I meant. But I was like, how did you hear about it? Cause it, nobody had ever heard about it. And I actually found this research like years ago when I was with Blackstone and I wanted to make it into a product back then. But um, I couldn't source it at the time, and uh, there were other products they wanted to push, so I just like pushed that off to the side. But the data is really fucking good, and mm -hmm. people that use it say it's really good. So like the idea is that when your adrenal glands are super stressed, your body's going to be in a catabolic state, and when you have high cortisol, that's what happens. So if you lower your cortisol um, synthesis by essentially, I don't know how many people know this, but cortisone is the inactive one cortisol is the active one so like your body has to turn cortisone into cortisol emodin inhibits that process by i think like up to 46 percent. so you're almost like cutting your cortisol in half so mm -hmm. i think that and by doing that your body is a much better state to burn fat and so what i noticed and what people have told me about using emodin as a fat burner it works really well because and you sleep better and stuff because your stress levels are lower. And if you think about it from like a dieting standpoint, one that stresses the shit out of your central nervous system and your adrenal glands, then you add in caffeine and fat burners and drugs and all, all these other things that so your body is super stressed. You're, you're probably way more anabolic. If you just could lower your cortisol a little bit, you would probably hang on to more muscle than taking all the drugs. You probably cut your doses way down if you just, were able to lower your cortisol during yeah. prep. Yeah. How did how did you discover it? Like you said, you mentioned you mentioned how years ago you found out about it, but like how do you stumble across this compound? Um, so Patrick Arnold, who I talked about before, had a product years and years and years ago called 11 Oxo. Mm -hmm. Um, and he used to write in MD 
and he had a column called The Code Chemist, and he wrote an article that was about elect, um, 11 hydroxy beta steroid dehydrogenase inhibi inhibition and how that can lower cortisol and, and how that can increase um, anabolic activity. And he, and he made that 11 oxo androstenediol, diol, I believe. So it's like, it's like uh, has three hydroxyl groups on it. And so that would inhibit that enzyme, 17 hydroxy beta steroid dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme that converts cortisone into cortisol. So I remember that product got banned and it was really hard to find. Um, and so I started doing research on that enzyme to see like how it works, what other things could do that. And I kind of stumbled across the paper in mice showing that it decreases cortisol by I think 46%. And I was like, this is, this is probably promising. I'm really surprised nobody's like brought this to the market. And so to clarify, I didn't discover it. I just found, found, randomly found the paper. I didn't discover mm. a motive, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was, uh, I, I do think that I was the first person to bring it to market. And I, and like kind of throw it out there as a way to burn fat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like for you, obviously there was an experimentation process to determine what you felt was an efficacious dose relative to rodent literature. And yeah. I'm sure you had some uncomfortable experiences on the <laughs> toilet while figuring this out. So a lot of people don't may not know if they haven't used it is the, diarrhea that you can get from this stuff is could be ruthless if you use too much or if you're yeah. not adapted to it yet so like coming up with your dosing schematic like what was that process like figuring out how it works in yourself so when i first released quarter block initially we had it in 500 milligram capsules and you would take two a day and then when i was beta testing that i was like okay this is way too much to take at once um and then so we cut it down to 250 to take up to four times a day. And that one milligram dose is kind of like the human equivalent from that study in mice. That's where that number comes from. Tolerable, you mean, once you build up to it, like I could take two and be okay now, like take 500 milligrams at a time before bed. But you don't, as a first timer, you do not want to take that much because it does, if, unfortunately, it has a natural laxative property that you can't inhibit. You just, your body will like build up for it, but you just, you can't prevent it. And like, so the first, I don't know, week you take it, definitely the first time you take it, it's a, it, there's definitely some gastric distress. Yeah. Put it lightly. So once you adapt to this higher dose, so you find you can maintain that. Whereas previously, if you, let's just say you started off the bat with 500 or 750, you think there could be an outcome where you have gastric distress that you otherwise could have adapted to had you started at 250 and tapered up and then kind of adapted to it otherwise? I do. I do. I think that because initially I was going to start at 500 milligrams and I, I just think that was way too much for, for me or for anybody to take just because of the laxative property. I do feel that if you could stomach it, for lack of a better word, hmm. getting up to the, the one gram, you would see significant changes. I mean, I, yeah. I, people people take half that dose and notice a big difference in just looking in the mirror and how they feel and how they sleep, mentally, physically. So, I do I do think it's effective, and I do think it really is inhibiting the enzyme and doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Unfortunately, it has a next natural laxative property that you cannot get around. Your body just has to figure it out. Some people told me that. They take five grams of glutamine with it, and that helps. Yeah, okay. Um, but I, I have not found something like not natural or non pharmacological that can prevent it from right. happening. Unfortunately, as, as far as the pharmacokinetic profile of it, have you found any like? Obviously, it's kind of just speculative in humans. Have you found like a buildup effect of it over? multiple days of dosing or what do you find to be like the ballpark of like you have a cycling recommendation presumably as do i um but this like recommendation have do you find a build-up effect personally when you use it or how do you kind of like when you're taking 500 every day do you find it's almost like builds up more and more and stacks on top of itself or what have you found um hold on can we pause it real quick i feel like there's no light anymore. I'm getting sick. Oh, yeah, sure. 
Okay, we're back. So you were discussing the uh, if there's build like a up. build up. Yeah. Okay, so I do think that if you start off at 250 and work your way up to 500, and then if you can work your way up to like 750 and one gram, you will have a build up result and you will get a linear response or semi linear response. Um, like like a normal dose dependent curve. But I do think that if you started off at a gram, sorry, I don't think if you start off a gram that that's the route to go because I think that it's always better to like have a ceiling or to have room to grow than to like start at like the cutoff point. Right. So I think that like t starting at 250 and I worked my up to like 500 and 500 was a really good dose for me uh, a gram was was really good as far as fat loss but it was a little bit hard on your stomach you know like not many people can take a gram of that stuff but i think theoretically if you could take the one gram uh and you build up to it and you could take that for i don't know let's say six or eight weeks you would notice you would have a significant difference in not only fat loss but you know sleeping better less stress in general the way your body reacts to stress like a bunch of things you probably don't think about yeah. that are related to cortisol. Like you taking that pre-workout every fucking time is stressing the shit out of your body. Yeah. So um, if you could keep cortisol levels in check, I think overall you'd be better like health-wise. Now, timing-wise, like I've always seen the utility of these cortisol modulating products, but especially Emodin as being best at nighttime because you are getting rid of the thing that is putting you into sympathetic overdrive that you might have otherwise put yourself in if you had high cortisol levels to begin with, like presumably your lifestyle got you there in some capacity or your like abuse of stimulants or maybe you're aggressively dieting, whatever it is, versus in the morning when you're trying to like get up and going, it seems like the timing would be best suited pre-bed. Is that what you found? Yeah, so two things, one, um, you need some cortisol. It's like it's how your body wakes up, right? Because yeah. cortisol releases fatty acids into your bloodstream, and that's how you get energy, immediate energy. And like that's where the fight, your fight or flight comes from, right? Elevated cortisol. Levels. So you do you do need them in the morning to wake up if if you're, you have a normal like lifestyle of waking up in the morning. Um, and then taking it before bed, like I said, you sleep better because you are lowering your cortisol levels and your stress, so you're not agitating every, your whole body and you know causing your body to be in like sympathetic overdrive right mm -hmm. so i think that between those two things there's no better time to take it than at night uh, before bed um the sleep aspect is is real and i think is overlooked a lot a lot of people probably don't sleep because of elevated cortisol like you said lifestyles whatever it is um and they, you really will notice a difference. I'm sure you notice a difference too, taking it before bed versus, you know, taking it, I wouldn't say take it before you go to the gym because that's kind of when you want yeah. some, some cortisol stimulation. So I always say, people ask me when to take it and I always say before bed and uh, post-workout are the two times, are the two best times to take it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I think one thing people overlook is how, a lot of anabolic androgenic steroids, anabolic androgenic steroids, a lot of their effects are not just mediated through AR agonism and muscle protein synthesis, but also reducing muscle protein breakdown and yes. anti-catabolic processes through their interactions with the glucocorticoid receptor. So trend, for example, very, very potent at modulating the GR. And that is why I think it is such a potent, like anti-catabolic, like contest prep drug that excels right. very well in a deficit. So Presumably, if you're in a if you're in a steep deficit, like cortisol levels go sky high oftentimes, like the amount of stress people put on their body during a calorie deprived, malnutritioned, sympathetic overdrive state is right. dramatic. So at some level, like obviously the anabolics do their thing too, but this cortisol, like overwhelming GR, presumably if you can lower that burden, you can preserve more muscle tissue too, not just from like a fat loss aspect. Right. So yeah, you see I, that to be like a, a benefit, presumably, of the Emodin as well, I would think. I, I do. I agree with everything that you just said about it. I think that if you're, you know, mod modulating your glucocorticoid receptor and you're inhibiting 
your body's ability to produce high levels of cortisol, I think that it will definitely have an anti-catabolic effect because cortisol, cortisol is one of the most catabolic, right? Um, hormones that your body has. I think it's like one of the main ones as far as like why you lose muscle. Um, that's why stress, like stress is a general term, but like stress does kill you over time because mm-hmm. uh, it is that detrimental on your body. So yes, reducing it will help um, prevent muscle breakdown and be anti-catabolic. And I think that's a really good benefit of it. I also just think that it's healthy to not have elevated cortisol levels all the time. Yes. But yes, I agree with you that it should, in theory, like keep more of your muscle on. That's why I, well, that's one of the reasons why I tell people to take it for prep. Obviously, the other one is to lower all of your um, adrenal gland stress. Yeah. So obviously, neither of us are suggesting to people to take this like year round or anything. It's more like situation dependent based on if you put yourself into a state that warrants it. So, like, obviously, if your normal lifestyle too, was putting you in a state where you needed a cortisol blocking agent chronically, (laughs) I would definitely recommend circling back and looking at like what in your lifestyle got you to that point and what is the root of the issue. So like, this is more so like if you're aggressively dieting or as a bandaid while you fix that shit, but ultimately why do you have this problem to begin with overarchingly more important than like taking a supplement, of course. So I just wanted to make that clear that people aren't taking this as like a, a sales pitch for taking cortisol inhibiting agents or something. No, I, yeah, for sure. Everything has a, a place and like it's specific to that time frame. I definitely wouldn't tell anybody to take it year round. I wouldn't tell anybody to take anything year round. I, I, I'm a big believer in cycling everything that you take, no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. So is, I do think that uh, Modin is like a situational thing. Yeah. And they, but you know how America is like, you want everything like right now instead yeah. of like they want the back. stimulation of the stimulants but also to fix the the adrenal issues that came from the stimulants and then to all like everything all at the same time yeah so like i get hit up all the time about so i made a product um for blackstone called adrenal care and then that's where i first started looking at a modin and then it just it didn't go in that product it went in and then it just came to something i did but the adrenal care worked really well and it, but if you can't take caffeine you got to give yourself a break and people mm-hmm. are like can i how long do i stay off caffeine i was like well if you take this product for 30 days straight it's a that will give a good amount of time for your body to not need caffeine and not go through all of the the stress that caffeine puts on your body but everyone wants caffeine it's like mm-hmm. the one addic- addiction that nobody cares about because yeah. you know it's, it's not the bad one but it is <laughs> But it, yeah, Amodin, it's it's not, I wouldn't use it, anything like that as a Band-Aid. Like you really need to go see what's actually causing your body to go stress. If it's big problems with prep, that's one thing. If it's something you're doing every single day in your life, like you said, that's completely different. Okay, so, so your first layer of fat loss that you would address, like if you're gonna go the pharmacology route, you would address cortisol is like your first, the thing you think is the main, I don't know, the lowest hanging fruit kind of thing is that I fair think, to say i think that it it's the most tolerated and it has like mutual benefits versus just taking like clan or ephedrine or something yeah. where you know you we know how that's going to work as far as fat loss but you also know that your the jitters and all the things you get associated with uh beta 2 agonists right mm-hmm. so okay. that's why i say that that uh the, that uh, cortisol inhibition not only will help you burn fat but like uh, like we just talked about can help you prevent breaking down muscle when you're doing which is super important obviously for pre-contest stuff so if you were trying to get to like single digit body fat and you were trying to address like all the vectors that you think are worthwhile like where do you go next after cortisol inhibition i go probably ephedra caffeine okay uh I, i i leave I would say T3 is like a super last resort because I think people abuse the shit out of it mm-hmm. and take way too much. And that's how you could fuck up your thyroid. So and how you strip muscle with exactly, in like a, yeah. non, a non-discriminant a non way too. You just like burn tissue in general. Exactly. exactly. There's yeah. no, it's not specific to burning fat or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, there was a, have you ever heard of, uh, I think it's Sebetronome, which is a GC1. Yep. So yep. like, so I don't, 
I have no idea where, like how this came to the market. I just know how I found it. And I, there was an old peptide place that I used to know. And I was like, Hey, can you source this? And they said, yes. And they made it, but I think it's like more available now, but that has really good data and worked really well for the fat loss part of thyroid without just ramming up your levels. And what was the, the unique mechanism of that, that made it superior to T3? I think it was that it's, it's not, it's not, it's not actual T3. It's working by, I think, is stimulating production of it. If I remember correctly, I'd have to look back at it, but I, I it, like taking straight T3, your body's just going to like your receptor gets it. It's the natural ligand. And then boom, you, you just, your metabolism just shoots up uh, where like, you know, people take T4 or like doctors prescribe T4. It still has to convert into T3 for it to actually work. Okay. I did, I just think that the the mech, the GC one uh, had a lot of the benefits. Like I think the main thing was it didn't cause catabolism. I think uh, that was the one difference between the two, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Yeah, that one. It was. Uh, I rem I think I remember your post on it, and I was like, oh shit, this looks really interesting. And then I never took it myself, but it seemed to be very promising. I I actually have no anecdotes though to even refer to if people have used it. Do you have? Have you used it or no? Yeah, yeah, I have used it. I actually still have a bottle of it that I haven't touched in my medicine cabinet, <laughs> but I, I used it uh, and it worked well for dieting because you, you see, I was still, I was taking it in the morning. I, I didn't have the, the crazy like T3 sweating and like um, muscle burning effects of it. I was, it was very smooth. And I was only doing like a small dose. I think it was like a hundred micrograms or something like that, if I remember correctly, or hundred milligrams. I don't remember the dose, but it was very low. And uh, I liked it overall. And, and then I introduced it to like some competitors and they liked it versus T3 because of the same things we were just talking about as T3, like rips muscle apart. Mm -hmm. So, but it's been, it's been years since I've taken it. So, but it, when I did take it, I definitely was noticing a difference just in the mirror like if you're i didn't take measurements or anything like that at the time do you know if it's in a current pharmaceutical pipeline or is it an abandoned drug candidate i don't i don't know if it's still in like clinical trials i think it was in um veterinary trials if i remember correctly there was it was a there was a vet drug for it but i don't know if they ever pursued it as a pharmaceutical i'm assuming no because it's been a long time since i've heard anything about it Mm. but I'd have to check, but things okay. get out of it. But like money is a thing that prevents things from being drugs, not just yeah. if they work or, or not just side effects related. So who knows if so they got canceled for that reason? I don't know. Mm. So we have your cortisol modulation. And then we have after that basic caffeine, ephedrine, ephedrine is a beta two agonist as well, right? For yeah. like, pr basically, presumably you use that instead of clen then is like, right. Know. Okay. It's, yeah. Yeah, I I personally don't like Clen. It mm -hmm. may I I react really badly to it. Like I get the shakes a lot from it. It's very it's too stimulating for me. Whereas Ephedra was easier than Clen was on my body, so that's why I preferred it. And you and Ephedra doesn't have like the the same rapid like degradation or like sorry not degradation like your expression of the enzyme doesn't just go go up so that way you're just breaking it down very quickly and so many people have asked me like the myth of taking um clen and uh, benadryl i'm sure you can oh, yeah, ask yeah. that a lot yeah and like there were because of the study that clen you had to take it with um what was the name of that compound ketodafin yes exactly yeah and and that's a very specific compound it's not just that any generic antihistamine but it's so funny to how bodybuilders just like no like yeah they, taking they, like fucking benadryl with their clan to be able to keep <laughs> using it like such such random bro yeah. mythology over the years yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah i think i like a fat I, I say i like i don't really like it but if, for fat loss i think it works well with caffeine um and then yo yo him alpha yo him i like much more than you know, MD because Same. like I personally get crazy anxiety from regular uh Yohim Bean. I feel like that's an ingredient that can make or break a lot of pre-workouts to a point it where is. it's like the stimulatory profile of it is like so 
adrenergic and racy that if you use like just too much, like you fuck it up for like 75% of people. Yeah. Uh, anecdotal story about that. <laughs> I guess uh, I got a sample of one that was supposed to be like, I think 6% and it turned out to be like double that or something. Oh, yeah. So when you use the dose, you think is that 6% active yeah. and, and it's really 12%. That's a huge difference in yoga. mean, and like you sweat all day and you just feel super uncomfortable. Yeah. That compound, it makes me feel like hypoglycemic in the gym. Like it's yeah. bad. The, can't perform it, at all when I'm using it. No, it's one of the worst compounds to take if you're going to the gym just for the way you feel yeah like at least alpha johan i find to be more potent milligram for milligram and mm -hmm. far more specific in what i'm trying to achieve with it than johan Bynes, just like broad spectrum adrenaline cranked sweaty fucking disastrous <laughs> anxious can't do anything kind of feeling yeah, yeah cuz it it's not selective enough to the different subunits of mm -hmm. the receptor of your alpha 2 receptor so the uh, um, alpha yohimbine, I think, selectively binds, if I remember correctly, it's to like two and three uh, subunits of your adrenal receptor or your A2. And so like, I believe that A, your A2-1 subunit is the one that like regularly yohimbine binds to, and that's what causes all of the, the negative effects that you get from it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's the reason why. And if you don't know the difference between yohimbine and alpha yohimbine, it's just the position of a hydrogen atom on the ring, whether it's going up or going down. Hmm. Okay. I didn't mean you. I meant like if yeah. our listeners didn't know what that is, what the difference is. That's it. So the last, okay, so the, I have, I can't end the conversation without talking about uh, <laughs> mitochondrial uncouplers. What are your thoughts on, <laughs> I'm assuming at some point you probably use like DNP or have an opinion <laughs> of it. What is your experience, if any? And I've seen some of your posts on BAM 15 and some of mm -hmm. these like novel drug candidates that may otherwise replace DNP in like a clinical setting for certain applications. What are your thoughts on the mitochondrial uncoupling family of compounds? I think that it's a mechanism of action. If you can find something that was natural or, or safer is a really fucking good mechanism to burn energy and fat. I, uh, DMP is it's just, it's something that I wouldn't fuck with it. And I know that certain people are very high on it. And, you know, some people used to sell it and I would never tell somebody to take it just because you, there's no, once you increase your body temperature, it's not like you could turn it down. Yeah. So, so once you hit a certain degree and that's when everything is detrimental, you can't just turn it off. It's, and the half-life is so long uh, your body's just going to sit at that temperature for too long and it, there's no regulation, zero regulation on that. So I just think like cost benefit uh, for it, I, I don't think it's worth it personally. I mean, I think you can pretty much achieve the same results and less toxic on your body going other routes that mm -hmm. we talked about. Um, I think that if you can find a comp uh, something that increases like UCP one or mimics the action of uncoupling, then then it's definitely worth exploring. Like uh, I made a project a product called Trojan Horse. It was my first supplement I made for Blackstone, and that combination of ingredients in the study showed that it it uh, increased like actually mitochondrial uncoupling, and so we made it as like a non-stimulant fat burner and it worked pretty well uh, considering it's not DNP. Mm -hmm. So that, I was always kind of fascinated on the mechanism of how uncoupling works in your body. And I'm sure, you know, but for those who don't know, basically you have a gradient of like hydrogens which are positive and electrons which are negative. And as you're, and that's what pushes forward ATP synthesis, right? So what you're doing when you uncouple is you're, changing you're getting all these protons out so your body has to like make that gradient again because it's like electrochemical energy and so that gradient if it gets smaller and smaller and smaller it's harder and harder and harder to act to make atp so that's kind of like the mechanism behind it somebody told me once it's like taking dmp is like poking holes through like a, a hose mm. 
say you have yeah. water going out and you're poking the holes through it. So it's just making it harder and harder to make ATP. So you're just burning more of it as energy. Yeah, that sounds, that's an accurate analogy, I would say. Do you think that, I don't know if you really follow the research closely, but some of these like newer compounds like BAM-15, do you think they're like superior compounds to DNP seemingly? Or like, what is the, like, I don't even- Efficacy wise, like, are they more effective or just less toxic? I guess like overall efficacy relative to side effect profile, do they seem superior in any capacity? And what is the even utility of them in a clinical setting that people are exploring? Like, I don't even recall that. I, I believe it was weight loss, if I'm not mistaken. Because oh, okay. oh. that's always been a, like a weight loss thing. I mean, DMP was sold as like a weight loss drug, mm. right? So I believe that was the research behind it. Um, I do think that they are less toxic compounds for sure um, than DMP. And I, so I think there is application there. I, I want, I really want to say the research application was weight loss, but I'd have to double check on that. There's so some think, like interesting stuff on like cancer cells and stuff like that. I don't want to like state anything as fact, obviously, but some of it looks like David Sinclair, the longevity researcher, he's been on Rogan multiple times. Yeah. That, that guy is, he talks about DNP in his book, why we age. And it's actually kind of, in, it's not in the context of fat loss either. It's like an anti-aging context. And it's kind of interesting. I've heard that theory too, like because of the oxidant capabilities of it or something like that. Like you, you reduce mitochondrial um, dam, not damage. You reduce mitochondrial or you increase mitochondrial biosynthesis. Is that the mechanism? I'd have to revisit what he said exactly, but I remember bookmarking it in the audiobook I have of his book and being like, oh, that's fucking interesting. And I might have made a video on it, actually. If I go to my channel and I just type in like David Sinclair DNP, I might have made a video. But yeah, it was something that was looking at it in its applications as like an actual health aiding thing, specifically from a mitochondrial function aspect, not anything to do with fat loss, seemingly. But Yes. So I, I, so I remember BAM15 was an was a insulin thing. I think it was for hypoglycemia. That's what it was like initially uh, looked into. And then it, like the study, I think, showed that it was, you were able to take off, like it helped, re um, it helped reverse diet induced fat. So you know how they always like make uh, rats fat and then try and yeah. make them skinny. That, I think that was the application was uh, insulin sensitivity and then to like burn off fat that was induced from dieting. Hmm. I put in the chat in case you want to watch when you get off. I, I did actually make a video. It's called DNP is now being studied for anti-aging, the world's most dangerous fat burner. So <laughs> if my editor could put a card in the corner too for anyone who wants to go listen in further, but I talk about that snippet from the David Sinclair book, but um, obviously don't recommend anyone doing it. It's just <laughs> interesting to me from a pharmacology aspect, as I'm sure for you as well. And yes. um, I know we're getting close to your... Uh, past your time even when you go to bed normally so i appreciate you staying up and answering all of these questions and giving some insight into the chemistry side of things the pharmacology side of things bodybuilding all of your experiences um from start to finish and your fertility very happy to hear that things are on the up and up for you and um i think we should definitely do it again man if you were have time to do another podcast sometime i think we could talk endlessly about this stuff yeah well i mean it's not my fault you live on the other side of the yeah. country <laughs> and yeah. in another country. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely love to continue this for sure. I know this was a long one. Uh, hopefully people like the information and, and we, we got them into it. Uh, I would like to say if people want to see more about me and like, I, and more videos that I've made on just like chemistry stuff, I make all these videos, like drawing out molecules to show how they work. And that's, like, that's what I was so fascinated with. Like, I think I told you this, but like why I got into chemistry was because I was always curious on if you had a headache and you take uh, like aspirin, why is your headache go away? Like what's mm. really happening? So like that kind of got me into the rabbit hole of like, okay, how does creatine work? Okay, how does testosterone work? How do all of these different, how does amphetamines work? Like, all, why do people take these stuff? Like, so I my the coolest thing in chemistry was learning mechanism of action for sure. And like, so when something binds, like, why is it binding here? Why does that cause the protein to like change confirmation and elicit all these effects? So that was what was cool. 
So that's a lot of the videos I make focus. They're chemistry heavy, but that's because I think it's fucking cool. Yeah, I think that's why I resonate with your stuff so much too, because I find it fascinating as well. And I definitely recommend anybody else who's interested in science-based uh, innovation, especially like in the supplement industry or just in general from like a pharmacology perspective, ways to improve quality of life, vitality, performance, check out uh, all of Brian's stuff. If you, you're you at Gorilla Chemist on Instagram, YouTube, what is uh, your ha at, handle? At, yeah, at the Gorilla Chemist with two R's, two L's. Uh, our Chemex web um, YouTube has all the videos on there for the, my brand and for the products that I make. And then um, I'm working on starting a YouTube channel. This, yeah, this get like, on that, dude. I, it would, I think I, people I, would love it. When you break down shit, it's like very, very, no one does it like you do with the whiteboard thing. So, and I, I find it very educational, personally. Well, I'm, I'm so it's just been a process. I'm, I'm kind of camera shy. Mm. <laughs> so that's one of the main reasons I haven't done it. But I, it, I definitely think getting information out there is, is way more important than how I feel on a camera. Right. All right. So everyone who wants to go check out his stuff, it's very, very informative. I think the main place you post your material is on Instagram right now. So make sure you follow yeah. there, especially if you're looking for more frequent, high quality posts on breakdowns of compounds, pharmacology, et cetera, at the Gorilla Chemist. I'll put a link in the video description below, as well as check out Chemex Lifestyle if you want to see some of the uh, innovative products he's bringing to this industry. And like, subscribe, and we'll talk to you guys soon.